diverting late night football conversation for prostitutes. How dare you! Chronic back pain sufferers. Oh, done the old back again. And security guards who haven't quite nodded off yet. Wake up! <coughs> the Michaels, Graham and Parry on Talk Sport. For when two mics are better than one. Look at the light! Go you see the light! You cannot transport a lorry load of bread in the saddle bag of a bike. Hello, how are you today? Yeah, you've never worked for a fraud sheet paper, have you? Yes, I have. Point that out. Yes, I have. Have you? Have I? Have you? No, you haven't. No, no, you haven't. You've never worked for a fraud sheet. Sure, uh, share, 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 share. Start sure. it. Start Just it. Start some Dutch again. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. This is Talk Sport Extra Time. We are the two mics, and it's time to say a very good morning to Mr. Mike Porky Parry. Very good morning to Mr. Parry. Night and mornings, I drink morning. I knew you'd do that. I I knew you'd do that. I didn't think you'd do it straight away, though. Well, I had to open the show with it, didn't I? I suppose you did, yeah. The story today, you know, Dick Advocar coming back. He's a wily old character, Dick Advocar. He certainly is. How do you think he's managed to convince his wife that he should take the job when she was the one that said Um, that she didn't want him to do it? Well, I think... I don't think that would have been a, a big problem, because... Being a student of psychology, I know that if you're living with a partner yes. who's got itchy feet and mm. would prefer to be somewhere else, right. it's not a good domestic atmosphere in which to thrive. It's certainly not. But in his case, you know, he's not going to walk away from her because they've been married for a long time. And if she doesn't 40 fancy, years. Yeah, and if she doesn't fancy him living in Sunderland, then what's going to happen? No, no, what I'm saying is the, the whole idea was that they were going to go back to Holland right. and he was going to live in his... Um, in his uh, huge mansion yeah. there, which is built on reclaimed land. Is it? His house in Holland is built on what used to be a fjord, to all intents and purposes. A fjord? Yeah. How do you think they had fjords in Holland? Well, it's a... It's a I thought they had fjords in Norway. It's an inverted fjord. Is it? It's not a big fjord where it goes it's very off. flat it sort of goes down. Really, yeah, it? yeah, but it's a lot of water there. You a lot understand of water. what I'm saying? Yeah, a lot absolutely. of water. And they, as you, as you well know, they... They have all this uh, the system of dikes and waterways in Holland to, because they reclaim so much land right. uh, from the sea. Mm. Uh, in fact, one third of, uh, of the total land mass of Holland is used to be sea. One third of their land is actually sea. One third of the land mass of Holland used to be the sea. How amazing! I mean, that's that's how well they've done in reclaiming land. Right. Now, now, uh, old Dicky Advocar lives on on a property built on what was formerly the sea, right. and the the land is very rich because mm. it's full of salt. Is it? It used to be salt water. Oh, okay, and it it's kind of like salt marshes, then. Yeah, that sort of thing. But he grows his own vegetables and all that kind of stuff. How and do you know so much about Dick Advocar? Uh, well, I know a lot about a lot of things, Mike. I know that. And um, and the whole idea was that he was going to sort of become like gentleman farmer mm. uh, in retirement and all that. However, the lure of Sunderland... And you have to say, he must probably be the first man in history who decided the lure of Sunderland was so strong that he was going to give up his millionaire lifestyle. Well, he was in, obviously very, in, uh, in, very uh, sort of closely connected to it, even though he wasn't there very long. You know, burst into tears yeah. and he managed to keep them up and all the rest of it. Yes. He's been promised, according to some of the uh, papers this morning, some kind of £50 million pound, uh, Well, uh, this, uh, is, chest, this right? is the only problem with this deal, you see. I, I very much admire um, uh, Dick Advocar for becoming so attached to the club so soon. I don't blame him for getting attached to Sunderland. I think they've got a fantastic tradition, Sunderland, and they've got a very good ground. And they've got a pretty good owner as well, haven't they? Okay, well, they've got an owner who's clearly... Um, going to be generous and prepared to back it if he's, mm. if he's putting up 50 million quid to a manager who's going to stay there for one year only, right. which, is a, which is a hiccup, which we'll come to in a minute. But, um, no, I, I think... I mean, remember as well, remember as well this. Dick Advocar may say to himself at the age of 72... I think he's 72, isn't he? I think so. He's 72. He might say Actually, to Actually, no, he's 67, sorry. 67. He's 67, is he? He is 67. Why did you tell me he was 72? Because I just nodded, uh, because I've been so kind of bamboozled by all this knowledge you've got of him. Yeah, I'm amazed you didn't yeah. know what his actual age was. Well, I, I, you know, I ask you uh, for one fact in a story where I know everything mm. about it, except that one uh, salient right. fact, and you even get that wrong. Yeah, I'm sorry but, about that. And, anyway, um, so he's 67, and I think what he said to himself is, hang on, this club really want me. They're in the Premier League in England. Yeah. It's a chance to sign off with a 12-month campaign in which I could restore the fortunes of a, a, a sleeping giant. How could he possibly turn that down? Down. He's gone back to Holland. He says they would not let go. Yeah, he's looked over those flat fields and um, and he said, yeah, I'm going to do it. But I think the very fact that he that they pursued him and, and, and said they would not let go mm. is, to me, an indictment of Sunderland because I think uh, they'll have a great season with Dick Advocar in charge. I think he's a good man, but he's not the future of Sunderland. And really, a club like, uh, you know, like that, who, who want to plough furrow 
in the um, in the uh, Premier League. And remember, um, for two years in succession under Peter Reid, they finished six in the Premier yeah. League. Think well, about that. Not Think the about case, that. Six is it not the case the that, that what they want to do is just have him sit there for about a year while they work out who is the person that's going to take them forward? And he's a pretty good uh, he's a pretty good bet for the short term, isn't he? Yeah, but are they going to give him fifty million pounds to spend on players who will play for him, but not might not want to play for the manager after him, or the manager after him might not want those players to be part of his squad? Well, they that say is they a big gamble. Well, they say they're giving him fifty million. Fifty million isn't isn't a, a great deal of money in the Premier League these days, really, is it? Tell you what, if you went to the managers of Everton, West Brom, Tottenham and said, do you want a 50 million quid to play with over the summer, they'd bite your arm off. Would they? Bite your hand off. Or even at Tottenham? Yeah, Are you sure? yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm pretty sure they would, yeah. But he's not um, going to be able to buy, you know, like a whole host of, you know, very, very good players. He can buy maybe one decent player and three or four others, right? Uh, I think a decent buy for Sunderland is a player costing 12 and a half million. Mm. And you get four of those for 50 million quid. Four times 12 and a half equals 50. Four good players. That could bolster a team. That could form the spine of a team. Uh, a goalkeeper, um, a central defender, a uh, midfielder. So and you're going to get a lot of basically pretty average players then for 12 and a half million? Well, I, I don't know. It depends on what your definition of an average player is. Um, some players for 12 and a half million, if you go shopping and use the knowledge you've acquired in football and pick the right player, mm. I think you could get a great player for 12 and a half million. I mean, James Milner's going for nothing. How about that? Yeah, I know. You were tweeting out earlier that you didn't think he should go to Liverpool. Well, I yeah, why but you, you said see, that. see, the problem is, whenever I tweet out an opinion about Liverpool, I get the usual sort of response. I'm a bitter blue. Yeah. That means that I'm a, an Everton player who Which feels bitter. Which you're not, are you? Of course. No, I'm not. I, I know have, you're not. I, I have no envy about any other team in the world, I yeah. swear to you, not Barcelona or Real Madrid, yeah. because I don't want to be a fan of those clubs. I only want to be a fan of Everton. Right. So there's no point in me being envious of another club because I don't put myself in the shoes of a Manchester United fan and say, oh, if only we'd had 30 years like they. Yeah. I don't put my 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 um, feet in the shoes of a Liverpool fan and say I wish we'd had five European Cups because it's irrelevant. Right. It means nothing to me unless that glory has been heaped upon. But so why Everton. have you said you don't think Milner should go there then? Uh, I, I think personally for for his own um, end to his career because it'll be the last big club he'll go to. I would imagine. Mm. I think he's going to sign off in a in a rather. What's the word I'm looking for? A desolate sort of environment. Because I think Liverpool is a desolate environment at the moment. But if Brendan Rodgers is staying. That's an extension of desolation that they've suffered for the last three years. They don't look as though they're going to get a new manager in the new year. So I, I just don't see a huge well of optimism and energy and aspiration at Anfield. Well, it depends if Raheem don't. Sterling se- uh, stays, really. Mm. Now, I was going to start well, he's the show... he's not going to stay, is he? Uh, well, I don't gonna... know. No, we, I don't know. Know. we know he's not going to stay. Nobody knows. I mean, there are is so many not stories... Through your head there are, no, there are so mm. many stories now linking him with Manchester City, Manchester United, yes. Real Madrid. Uh, almost every day there's a different story, and you wonder if, if that is the case, that somebody must be uh, just kind of agitating mm. and, and putting those stories in the paper, i.e. somebody who's uh, mm. uh, on his uh, on his team in some way, shape or form. But what I was going to say to you is, yes. is this going to be uh, another night when we start off with, uh, with yet another FIFA story? But we haven't because you've started off with Dick Advocat. But, I mean, the FIFA story yeah. in the last 24 hours, again, yeah. has been remarkable. We're going to talk to someone from the New York Times who broke the story, you know, a week ago. That's, uh, um, that's excellent. We've got them on the show. We're coming up yeah, next, excellent, yeah. But uh, um, mm. the Irish uh, revelation is uh, remarkable. And, of course, last night, well, you, around about yeah. half past three, quarter to four, mm. that was when the uh, the Jack Warner stuff kind of broke. And that yes. still hasn't come to pass yet, has it? I mean, he's threatening some avalanche of uh, financial detail that he's going to give well, to the US uh, attorney. It, it, and we don't even know what that is yet. No, we don't. But he, he's hinted broadly that FIFA extended their um, their levels of dodgy deals yes. into gerrymandering the makeup of governments mm. in smaller nations, so that those governments would in fact count out to FIFA. That's, yeah. a, that's a remarkable allegation. It is a remarkable allegation, and we yeah. don't know whether anything that he comes out with is going to be provable, mm. or whether anything that he says is, yeah. is actually not going to be going to completely off the wall. But I mean, the story is just remarkable. And mm. uh, the other thing that amazed me yesterday was Seth Blatter in a powder blue jacket, the light cut of which I thought you might admire, because you were talking about yeah. how you might buy some powder blue trousers the other day. I bought, sitting I bought his, them, actually. Have you bought them? Yeah, yeah I might, I might wear desk. them for the show on Sunday. He tweets out a picture of himself sitting yes. at his desk, you know, mm. busily working, mm. working on reforms, he says. Yes. Which is remarkable, <laughs> isn't it? Do you know what somebody said to me today? Seriously, I was out and about um, the day. I was with Mr Brazil and other people. They said, have you read exactly what he said in his, mm. quotes resignation speech the other night? Right. I said, no. He said, he said he intends to offer his resignation. Yeah. He hasn't actually resigned. Yeah. 
I said, really? I said, has the World Press missed this? He said, well, look at the detail. He said he intends to put into place, uh, you know, the mechanics right. of him resigning, And but he, he didn't say, I resign. And he, he's, he's kind of he's, appointed he's, this other guy who is very yeah. close to him who's going to be sort of carrying on various duties exactly. of reform, you, you wonder he's still a, going to be there. Yeah, you, you wonder a bit whether this is a, a Mr Putin-type mm. trick, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, uh, I, uh, I have to abide by the Constitution. I can only be in the Kremlin for five years. However, in the next five years, I'll become Prime Minister mm. and my puppet will become president, so yeah. I'll still be running the country, but well, I, I won't th- actually be the face of I the think, country. I think that's more in hope than in uh, actual mm. belief, but we shall see. Mm. We're going to talk next to Andrew Das from the New York Times and find out what they've got uh, coming up in the next couple of days. Uh, he's Mike Parry, I'm Mike Graham. Uh, we are the two Mikes. Loads more coming up. This is TalkSport Extra Time with the two mics. It's Porky Quiz Night, of course, and that's going to be coming up a little bit later on in the show. There's loads of football stories. Going to be looking ahead to the Champions League final, of course, as well. Right now, though, uh, we're going to be back on the old uh, FIFA story because last night uh, there was an amazing revelation at about sort of 3.30 in the morning. And who knows, there might be another one coming up uh, uh, in the next few hours. So we'll be on top of all of that. Uh, we'll, we'll break any news that, uh, that comes into us. We're going to talk now to Andrew Das, uh, who's a New York Times sports reporter. New York Times, of course, uh, famously broke the story of the... Uh, of the raid that was going on mm-hmm. in, uh, in uh, Zurich uh, last week before all of this all kicked off. Andrew, very good morning to you and welcome. Good morning, uh, Mike and uh, Mike. But Mike and yeah, Mike, it is you. indeed. Yeah, thanks very much for uh, for joining us. I mean, the New York Times kind of led the way on this. The story keeps um, spreading all over the world to different parts of it. Jack Warner came out with his stuff uh, in the middle of the night for us last night down in uh, in Trinidad. We've had the Irish uh, FA connection now to uh, a five million euro payment that was made, which FIFA say was a loan, uh, and uh, they don't seem to have paid it back. Um, it's an incredible story, isn't it? It's the gift that keeps on giving if you're in the newspaper business, for sure. It absolutely is. What are you guys uh, working on? Because obviously we assume that you had the kind of the jump on everybody else because you were getting some kind of uh, uh, information from the U.S. Attorney's Office over in, uh, in the U.S. They've been quite clever about which bits they've, they've fed out to the press. Chuck Blazer's stuff came out yesterday. Um, what's coming up in the next few days that you can tell us about? Well, let me first correct you on that. Um, the... Uh, the the story last week uh, was the result of some really, really terrific reporting from our FBI guys in Washington, our justice people, and our people at the district attorney in New York. Uh, I, I, I've told several people this, but if anybody thinks investigators, after four years of work, are going to tell a newspaper that they're going to arrest some people uh, and maybe blow the whole thing, they're, they're crazy. Our guys did some great work. Yes, uh, we found out a little bit ahead of time and happened to be in the right place at the right time. Well. We obviously knew to be in the right place in the right time, so that there was some of that. But uh, to think that people handed it to us was uh, is incorrect. Yeah, I didn't uh, really, I didn't, I didn't really mean they handed it to you. I no, just no, thought that you know you I guys know, had had, had, the had the connections with the U.S. attorneys there, so that was that was right, useful. Right, you know? right, right. right. Uh, well, you know, having good sources is part of any sports writer's job, any reporter's job. I just uh, the perception is out there, and I, I like to correct it when I can. Sure. As for what's going, we will uh, we're following. Obviously, where wherever this leads, the Ireland thing came out of the blue today. Uh, we had some reporting when they released Chuck Blazer's guilty plea yesterday. Uh, I obviously am not going to tell Talk Sport where we're going, <laughs> as you can imagine. But uh, we're not done with this story for sure. Andrew, may I ask you this question, please? You're from that side of the Atlantic, and we over here are, you know, absolutely spellbound by this story unfolding on Chuck Blazer. Um, one fact we picked up yesterday is that he's being treated for some form of advanced cancer. We think it's colonic cancer. Hasn't been seen in public for eight months. Is there any sort of perception that this is a man who may be now looking at his own mortality has decided to wipe the slate clean, you know, in a deal that maybe is preempting him meeting his maker, a man clearing his conscience before ultimately facing life's biggest challenge? Uh, I think there may be part of that, but I believe the bigger pressure on Chuck Blazer is that the IRS, the tax people here in, in, in the States, came to him three or four years ago and they said, you haven't filed taxes in years and you owe us a ginormous sum of money and you will now either produce that money or you will help us go after some other people. Mm-hmm. And I think they leaned on him. Uh, I, as with everything in FIFA, I believe this prosecution started over money, mm-hmm. I think money will be where it goes, wherever it goes. Yes, Chuck Blazer has uh, 
I believe he said in his guilty plea yesterday, is rectal cancer of all things. Yeah. He uh, he has high blood pressure. He in he has, I believe, some heart issues. Chuck Blazer is not a well man. Uh, we went. We had a reporter went to the hospital where he was the other day. Asked at the desk if they could see him. They told him the room number. We went up to see him, but Chuck Blazer can't speak. He's lost his voice. Um, he's he's just not a healthy man, and and sadly for his family and the people who love it may may not be long for this world. And yeah, uh, in a strictly soccer sense, he may have done some good on in his last days. I think yeah. by telling what he knows and turning some people in, whether it's score settling or, or who knows what, sure. or just making peace with the tax man. Um, he's, he's led us to where we are today, clearly, because a lot of this clearly came from things that Chuck Blazer would have known. Sure. And, and the scale of, uh, of this investigation, I suppose, is, um, is, is infinite in a way, because as they talk to more and more people, they get more and more leads, they follow more and more uh, people in different parts of the world. Is the jurisdiction of the U.S. attorney... Um, going to be kind of infinite as well, or are there things that they, they won't be able to look into? Well, that would be a better question for a lawyer. I mean, they got cooperation from the Swiss, obviously. They wisely chose, in, you know, from an outsider's view, they wisely chose to wait until all a bunch of the people they were looking for gathered in one place. They, then they only had to ask one government to help instead of asking, you know, you, if you ask about arresting Chuck Blazer or Jack Warner, where they're from, they're going to find out about it before it'll happen, and you're probably not going to get a lot of cooperation. So they went about it the right way, kept the, the circle as close as they could, and pinched a lot of guys at once. Mm. And, uh, Andrew, t- talking about the, the main characters in this huge saga, maybe the biggest alleged uh, villain is uh, Jack Warner. Now, we know that the people who arrest in Switzerland are now languishing in a jail uh, in Zurich. We know where Chuck Blazer is, but I don't know where Jack Warner is. Is he still floating around Trinidad and Tobago as a free man, or has he been taken in by the authorities? Well, he, he turned himself in the day of the raids in Zurich, he turned himself into the police. They uh, arraigned and they they uh, released him on several hundred thousand dollars bail, I guess. Mm. And he is, I would assume, going to fight extradition uh, from Trinidad, which may take a couple of months. Uh, I think forty days is the period that the Swiss have. So maybe it's maybe that's an international limit, or maybe it's a treaty limit. But he is, as far as I know. Uh, Going about his life in Trinidad and making mm. Facebook see, see, videos. See, I, I, would really have thought, I would have thought, Andrew, sorry to interrupt there, that if these guys are allegedly, you know, have control of millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, to leave them free, unlike the guys in Switzerland, there's always a, a, a danger, isn't there? They're going to go around and start manipulating bank accounts and all this if they're walking as a free man in the middle of this huge financial scandal. Oh, goodness, yes, I, the... the South Americans, who may be the richest men in this whole group, as far as I know, have not been arrested. Mm. Uh, and and uh, as of yesterday, had not been arrested. So, uh, yeah, they're they're out and about. Uh, there's not so many places, I guess, you can go. But mm. and they're not drug lords. I mean, these are financial crimes. I think sure uh, they're not out killing people. But um, eventually, I think. Uh, there will be a knock on the door for them as well. So it's a matter of the US Hopefully. attorney kind of getting a, um, a deal with whichever country they mm. happen to be in. And what about Jack Warner's claims that he made uh, in this kind of uh, television address yesterday uh, where he was saying that he was going to unleash all sorts of uh, uh, details and avalanche of financial information? Presumably he's going to give that, or he plans to give that, to the US attorney. But it, it has, and maybe you guys would know better than me, hasn't he threatened that before? Didn't he threaten that when they threw him out of FIFA? In 2011, yes, he did. Uh, that he was going to that he was going to tell all, and he never did because telling all directly implicates Jack Warner in any number of illegal mm. things. Mm. So I think it's it's a lot of bluster from him. It certainly wouldn't serve him legally to tell what he knows because mm, he's right in the middle of everything. Maybe.
Indeed. Mm. Well, Andrew, uh, good luck with the investigation. Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to us. Andrew Das there from the New York Times. Mm. Obviously, it's going to be quite a long, drawn-out scenario, this, but, uh, yeah. but the Irish situation came right out of the blue, didn't it? Because, well, obviously, until uh, um, we, do, we do knew you... a little bit about the, the, right. the French situation okay. yesterday, but we didn't know about the uh, Thierry Henry money. Well, you see, now, this is interesting, Mike. You say it came out of the blue and all that. I wonder whether now there's such a frenzy surrounding FIFA that everything they've done over the last ten years will now be, uh, you know, hit a bomb. Let's say, oh, look at this scandal. Right. Look at this scandal. I don't think the Irish thing's a scandal. Why not? I'll tell you why. Because, and um, the the guest on the show before this one, the, um, the, the David James, the goalkeeper, yeah. I heard him say exactly what I'm going to say now. The, the The decision about the handball took place during a football match yeah. and could in no way be rescinded after that game. The referee had made a decision. He didn't give the handball. Thierry Henry got away with it. Mm. That was it. Right. There was no pressure whatsoever on FIFA to compensate the Irish because if the Irish had gone to court, almost certainly, you ask any legal expert, they would not have won the case no. because it took place during 90 minutes of football, right? But it could have made things complicated, couldn't it, if they had? Uh, maybe, but the, the FIFA had a responsibility to stand up and say, well, look, you know, we're defending the, the, the laws of football and I'm sorry, it was the referee's decision... We can't do anything about it. Now, FIFA's one of FIFA's main jobs, and they do accumulate huge amounts of money, is to redistribute that money to poorer football nations, yeah. of which I think you can call Ireland one. Because, as, they, as they see fit. But, as they uh, see this fit, was, because this Ireland don't a, get huge attendances. This you know. was for a specific purpose, and it was basically to, to, to make the, the problem about the Thierry Henry goal go away. Oh, well, I don't it? accept that. I don't accept there was a problem with the Thierry Henry goal in international terms. I, m- my view is that problem ended when the final whistle went, and I'm sorry, the result has to stand. Well, this That's is what the Irish the FA is saying. The Irish yeah. FA is saying it was as a direct result of them kind of making noises about what was going to happen Well, I, I think they're misguided, because I tell you what, what ended up with, that money went, and we know that money did not go into the pockets of any Irish official or anything like that. There's no allegation whatsoever right. of that. It did actually end up building that stadium in Ireland that I've been to. Is it the Aviva Stadium? It is. But um, isn't that also and, the and, point and, about... And, and that is a magnificent monument to investment by FIFA, in my but view. But doesn't it also tell you this is how FIFA operated, though? If there was a problem, they would just sort of throw some money at it. Now, you might say there's nothing wrong with doing that, mm. and if it was a loan, fine. If they're going to pay it back, fine. It doesn't appear to be the case that they're going to pay it back. But in the end, uh, it tells you more about the way that the organisation kind of works more than anything well, else, Well, I, I still don't think they did anything wrong there, and I think we're in danger now of looking at every FIFA decision, as I say, over the last ten years, and say, oh, that's bent, that's bent, that's bent. But their job is to redistribute money. It ended up with a stadium being built. Everybody in Ireland benefited. The world benefited, because when clubs now go to Ireland to play football there, they've got a better stadium than they had before. Mm. I don't see a problem at all. But if it wasn't uh, uh, anything untoward, then why was it not just made public at the time? I have no idea, but I can tell you that the idea that you would actually say, right, um, you know, a deal has been reached between FIFA and the Irish following this and all that kind of stuff, to me is completely irrelevant. I think I think this story about the compensation for the Thierry Henry incident has emerged over a, a series of months, if not years. Mm. I believe at the time that was a grant from FIFA to the Irish, and it, I think it coincided with, you know, for instance, what I'm saying is... The the um, the focus was on Irish football when this happened, OK, yeah. with the French game and all that. I think it could have been a situation in which there'd already been talks or Ireland had put in a bid for a grant or something like that, and all of a sudden they said, well, look, Ireland seemed to have been badly done to by this decision by the ref. I tell you what, why don't we go ahead and give them the grant for the... the... I think it's a bit like that. Well, it might be a bit like that, but yeah. that unfortunately sets a bad precedent as well. We'll talk some more about this coming up. Mm. Uh, he's mm. Mike Parry, I'm Mike Graham. We are the two Mikes. Loads more coming next. Slightly more elegant version of the Champions League uh, signature tune. Yes, isn't it? It's very it's exciting, it's, yeah. isn't it, when you hear that music? If you're in the uh, uh, the stadium for the final, uh, if you're in the stadium for the final, it is. Yeah. How what many was the last final? How many finals have you been at? I went to the one in Glasgow that you went to. Yeah, I didn't know went you were there. The Dan- yeah, no, you didn't know we were there. But uh, who were you working for then? I was working for the Mirror then. Yeah, I? that's right. Well, you weren't in radio, you see, so I wouldn't have regarded you as being, uh, you know, quite as important as me. Oh, really? Um, well, you don't regard me as, imp- as important as you, anyway. Oh, of course do you? I do. You never have. No, no, you've managed to catch up. No, oh, have I? Okay. Yeah, oh, thank you very yeah, much. You've managed to catch up. But, uh, you know, I was doing the record show with Mr. Brazil at the time. Yes. We were like uh, un- n- numero uno banano mm. and, uh, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that was when Zidane pulled the ball out of the air, wasn't it? And, That's right, uh, yeah. It's got that fantastic yeah, goal. It seemed to fall down at yep. sort of a very slow speed. And Next one I went to it. was in the Stade de France when Arsenal had to try and beat Barcelona with ten men. Right. After, who got sent off? The goalkeeper? Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, it was, yeah. But I was, I was, uh, I was sitting with the wives and uh, wags of the uh, Arsenal team. Oh, were you? 
because um, I got my ticket through Mr Townsend. Oh, you got your was... ticket through some nefarious uh, well, well, method? Well, no, Andy was doing the commentary on no. it uh, for ITV. Oh, OK. So, uh, you know, I was sitting in that sort of celebrity you area. You didn't pinch it from somebody else, then? No, I didn't pinch it from somebody else. But I'll t- I tell you what happened. Um, was this in the Stade de France? Yes, it was. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Go right. On. So I got this ticket, which I paid for. Mm. It was £750. £750? Pounds. Pounds. Honest God, yeah. Just for one seat? For one seat. And it was supplied by um, somebody Andy worked with at ITV. Mm. I don't know who. Um, Isn't and, that something uh, uh, slightly um, no, uh, illegal? Then? No, no, not illegal at all. And Andy wasn't a middleman or anything. Right. I, he just said, look, mate, I already had a ticket, you know, for the press area and all that. He said, if you want a really good night, he said, I know one of the lads has got a ticket. Right. And I, and, and he so said, you're not getting anybody into trouble by telling I'm got, story. I'm not getting anybody into trouble. The face value of the ticket was £750, right. or the equivalent of So what did you get euros. for that? Did you get just a seat? Well, did I'm you... just about to tell you. Okay. just about to tell you. So what happened is you you went up to the Stade de France, right, mm. and you went into the VIP area, right. and it was like a village. They built this village, hospitality village. There were six bars in there, all sorts of eateries, right. you know what I mean? You know, your kebabs over here and the roast chicken over there and all that kind of thing. Absolutely fantastic. Very high-class stuff, then. Very, very high-class stuff, indeed. And um, big screens in there to see all the build-up to the game and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Now, the, I went up there, and I, was, I, think, I think I was with, um, I was with the agent, uh, um, not John Smith, his brother Phil, Phil uh-huh. Smith, that's right. And we walked up to the ground, and we both had similar tickets, so he'd got his from somewhere as well. So anyway, we asked this French official, right, how do we get to the VIP hospitality area, please? And this official said, oh, we oui, be oui, uh, no problem. Uh, you go through the gates marked number uh, quattro. And, uh, quattro? You know, yeah, uh, um, uh, what's it, uh, Cotra. Quatre, Quatre, I don't know. Quatre. Was it number four? Four, yeah. Quatre. And, and, uh, Quatre, yeah. Quatre, yeah. He said, and, uh, and then you will be inside the ground and you go over to that side and it's over there. I said, right. well, thanks very much. So we go through gate four, right, no right. joke. And then we started walking in the direction of the VIP hospitality suite. But between the inside of the area we were in, the hospitality suite, was a huge fence. So we said to the official, um, we just want to go in there. He said, well, you, there's no uh, access to the VIP hospitality suite from here. Right. You have to enter it from outside of the ground. I said, oh, OK, thanks. So we went back to the gate we'd come in, we explained, and they said, well, you can go into the VIP hospitality suite if you want, but I'm afraid we can't then let you back into the ground. It's one access only on this ticket. So you can't go into the hospitality and see the game? Uh, no. That seems ridiculous. Uh, no, no, we could have gone into the hospitality game, but we wouldn't then get back into the stadium. Oh, right, OK. So you could have watched it on a screen, you mean? Yeah, but we wouldn't be allowed back in the stadium. Right. Well, and this is the mad. and this is the Champions League final. Right. So frustratingly, Phil and I had to um, uh, put up with a couple of free um, tins of uh, Heineken or something. That must have been awful uh, for you. It was awful because the seven hundred and fifty pound ticket gave us access to the best hospitality suite in the world at a football match, right. and we couldn't go in. So anyway. Um, you know, it was it, it was so frustrating that I decided after the game to make up for the loss of hospitality before the game. Right, so where did you go then? I went into the hospitality suite because mm. then I could go in after the game right. from the. Well, you're not supposed area. to be working at this thing. No, I wasn't working at all. No, I'd done my work before the game. Oh, okay. I'd, I'd spent eight hours during the day with Arsenal fans all day long. You know, right. doing stuff for Talksport and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I, eventually, I got back in there after the game. And then I thought, right, that's it, I'm going to make up for before the game. So I stayed till 5am, mm. um, and I was the last one to leave the hospitality area. Were you carried out on a stretcher at that point? No, no, not at all. You know, I, I behaved myself impeccably, but I decided to get my, uh, my full value. Excellent. But then, because it was so mad the morning after the game, there were no taxis, and I walked seven miles back to the hotel. In Paris? In Paris. Right. Where were you yeah. staying in Paris? Uh, whew, somewhere near the uh, Lac de Triomphe. Ah, OK. Yeah, yeah. You must have been quite fortunate not to have been um, robbed or something in that time of the morning, mustn't you? Well, Paris isn't bad. Mm. The, the place where I, I, I should have been robbed was when I came out of the ground in Moscow after the very, very famous uh, Chelsea-Manchester United right. final, right? So that's the third one you've been to? That's the third one I got to, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that was magnificent. I was in Moscow with uh, Alan Brazil and, and people like that, you know. And I went to the game. I don't think I went to the game. I think he had something else to do. He was working somewhere. But anyway, the point of my story is, the point of the story is, uh, again, there was a massive hospitality suite. Now, I did get bladdered at that one because I got into the vodka. Mm. There were about 30 different flavours of vodka. Banana, strawberry, peach, And was this before the game or after the game? Well, both. Yeah. Both, both. Okay. But uh, it was such a dramatic one, you know, and, um, and I was quite friendly with a couple of Chelsea players at the time whose books I was writing because, as you know, I'm... Of course, you're a books, very yeah. famous author, yeah, yes. The, the, Excuse me, exactly. But anyway, came out after the game at about three in the morning. And in, in Russia, nobody speaks English. In Moscow, nobody speaks English. 
So I wandered along the line of limos, right, which were all parked out there, waving American dollars around, which is the best way to get anything done in mm. Moscow, you know. And eventually a guy gets out of the car... Uh, and the, what you have to do is, in places like Moscow, you have to carry your, your uh, hotel card around with you because it's written in Russian. And to I prove where you're going. Well, just to show them where yeah. you're going, because I haven't got a clue where I was going. I didn't even know which hotel I was staying in, and I sort of got bladdered. Mm. And uh, I showed this uh, this chap this... Um, I said, yes, you, uh, you know, get in. So I got in, and we settled on $100, and he then took me back to um, the hotel. But the next morning in the hotel, I talked to one of the concierges who did speak English, and he said, oh, you were very lucky to get home um, uh, this morning. I said, why is that? He said, well, he said, I know of at least three or four Westerners who don't speak Russian, who get into um, stretch limos or just ordinary limos in this town, and actually who end up face down on the banks of the River Moscow. Never seen again. Never seen again. But shouldn't you have had somebody with you, like some kind of a interpreter or something like that? Why? Somebody that you just paid to kind of make sure you didn't go to the wrong place or no. end up in a, a, a bad area or something no, like no, that? No, no, not at all. You know, I, I, I was so confident of my knowledge of Moscow. I'd been there four or five times and my uh, camaraderie with the people of Russia that I thought everything would be all right. Yeah. And but what I'd... about, like, all the other press guys? Because you must know most of them, wasn't you? Well, I wasn't in the press box. Right. No, I wasn't in the press box. I was... I was uh, as it, again, the work had all been done during the day. And, in fact, the next thing I was doing, I think, was the mid-morning show that morning, you know, so I had to get home hastily, mm. get showered and all that, and try and erase the uh, the ravages of... Uh, try and unmuddle vodka, your brain. Yeah, did you manage that to that do that stuff. successfully? Oh, yes, I did, yeah, I did. But the guy said you were lucky to get home. He said we have at least three customers here who simply never got back. You know, they got... What the guy does is he takes you off to somewhere where his mates are waiting and they literally take out the car... Yeah, because you'd have no idea, would you? to pulp, that's right, steal all your credit cards, all your money, your Rolex watch and everything. He said, I don't know how you got home. But that could have happened to you in any number of places where you used to go and do jobs when you are a reporter as well, right? Because sometimes you're in a kind of a dangerous spot and you don't even know it. Yeah, but you're not always in bladderation. Normally, if you're working, you're actually compass mentors. You've got your wits about you and all that kind of mm. stuff. And, and, and by the way, mostly speaking... When you move around in our business, you move with a crew of two or three, so you're usually OK. But I just happened to be a spectator at this game, and I was on my own. I, I, I was, um, it was amazing. You know, I started shaking a bit later on, thinking, wow, I really put myself at risk there last night. Must be more careful. You must be more careful. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. Uh, we got uh, a lot more stuff to talk about. Yes. We've got the Porky quiz coming up. I hope yes. you've been uh, boning up on Coronation Street. Oh, you bet. Somebody asked me earlier, is it got any kind of uh, time limit as far as how far back does it don't go? Don't need one. And you didn't want a time don't limit. Don't need so one. It could be about any part of Coronation yes. Street from yes. when it actually starts. Yes. Don't need one. He is Mike Porky Parry. I'm Mike Graham. More coming up next on Talk Sport. Talk Sport. And it's in! A diving header at the end of a 50 yard run. From the root to the tip. Talk Sport. Recognise that voice? That, sound, um, that sounded to me like um, quite a powerful voice. That was Freddie Mercury. It was indeed. Yeah. Who wants to live forever? Yeah, great. Who well, does want to live forever? I suppose we all do, really. But listen, the reason I don't think I do want to live forever. No, actually. I don't live forever. I don't live forever. But, I mean, soon people will be living to the age of 100. Right. Yeah. Did you see this ridiculous test that they were giving people well, yesterday? Is, 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 this so, something I, that came out. They were doing it on TV yesterday afternoon. I was watching oh, it. Oh, no, I didn't. How I didn't. to tell whether you're going to die in the next five years. Well, Pretty morbid I stuff. i tell you where this comes from. It's, uh, it's just like a scientific thing. The government uh, asked a load of scientists to get together. And, apparently, in a five-minute test mm. online... Right. I think it's online these days. You can work out whether you've got your lifestyle in line. And I looked at it, Mike, and my immediate concern was you ain't got long to live. Is that what you think? Let me just tell you why. Come on, how old well, are you? Well, hang on, because I watched a bit yeah. of this on the TV yesterday and they were getting people to have something like uh, a 2.1% chance of dying in the mm. next five years or mm. a 0.6% mm. chance. So, I mean, presumably you'd have to have a very, very high percentage chance of dying if you're actually going to die. Yeah, but, I mean, the thing is, you look at the conditions for a healthy life and the conditions for an unhealthy yeah. life, you're in trouble. Am I? For instance, uh, how old are you? We'll gloss over that, because I know you don't like talking about your age. I don't mind talking um, about my age. Uh, how many cars or vans are available to your household? How many cars yeah. or vans? Uh, two, I suppose. Yes, which means you don't do a lot of walking, you see. How many people live in your home? Um, well, it depends which one you're talking about. Oh, well, there you go, you see. Three see? Yeah, or possibly see. one. See, that's a problem as well. Right. Uh, uh, um, who are the people you live with? Wife, partner, children? Yeah. Yeah, well, you see, again, you see... You're just What's not, wrong with that? Well, you're not getting out and about, you see, you spend too much time at home. Well, you haven't asked me about whether I go out yet. 
Well, well, I, I'm going to, about to ask you. Okay. If you just, you know, have a bit of patience. Uh, the next one: Do you smoke? Do you smoke heavily? Right. See, the answer to that is for you is yes, isn't it? I suppose so. How often have you smoked in the past? Always. That's the answer for you. For as long as I can remember. As long as you can remember. Did, yeah. you, did you smoke all the way through the time we were in New York? In yeah, the I think so. Yeah, I mean, I've only given mm. up a couple of times. Yes. Uh, very, yeah. very briefly. Yeah, and 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 this is the crucial one, which will send a shiver down your back. In general, how would you rate your overall overall health? In general, I would say it's okay. Okay. What are you supposed to say? I mean, is it okay. a, a scale of what, one to ten? Just says how would how would you rate? Well, it? how can they possibly judge it if you answer the questions? You know, like I'm answering them. Well, I I, I can't. I answer mean, that what one. if you were answering the questions? Yeah. For example, how many people live in your home? Uh, me. You. Yeah. Right. And how often uh, do you have access to cars and vehicles? Uh, Any time I want. Any time you well, want. I so it's exactly miles the same, then, No, 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 because I my, my caveat is I walk... I, well, I, you haven't asked I, me how many miles a week I walk. Well, you don't walk any miles a week. I do, I walk the dog. That's that's about 200 yards. And I walk... Well, no, no I, walk, I walk the dog probably about 10 or 20 miles a week, depending on... No, that's uh, rubbish. Know, that's that not is rubbish. utter rubbish. How is it rubbish? You don't walk 10 or 20 miles a week. You probably do with a dog, yeah. At an average speed, right, walking a dog at mm. two miles an hour, that would be 40 hours of walking a week. The dog runs. Yeah, yeah, but you amble after the dog, and then yeah, the, I do. And, and then the dog scurries around, and then the dog goes. Yeah, but by the time I've gone out and stuff. walked all the way around and, and yeah. come back the other way, yeah. it's probably yeah. about two miles, three miles each time. Well, I, I, I can't see that, man. And anyway, you don't go back to the country every day. I mean, no, you're I trying don't. to pull the wool over people's That's eyes true. here, right? Uh, how would you describe your usual walking pace? My usual walking pace is leisurely. I would say. I'd say it's sedate. Sedate, would sedate. you? Sedate, right? Yeah. Okay. Which means very, very. Well, slow. you're the one uh, who's got a problem with your heart, though. Surely you're in much more danger than I am in this. No, five years. no, be- no, because you see, you see, this is this is uh, this is the counter philosophy. Yeah. Because I know I have a problem, yeah. I take greater care of myself. Do you? To try and make sure that problem doesn't finish me off. Okay. okay. Right. Has has a doctor ever told you you've got diabetes? Uh, no. What a stupid question. That is that a is. stupid question. The whole thing's stupid. Complete, the whole thing doesn't make any sense at all. Stupid question. Because that. that that's not a question you put to anybody. Anybody who's been told they've got diabetes has got diabetes. Yeah, surely the question should be, are you a diabetic? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I mean, this makes it sound like doctors for fun sometimes yeah. tell people, oh, you've got diabetes. No, only kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> it's a ridiculous. bit of a laugh, yeah. Right, next one. Has a doctor ever told you you've had, ca- you've had cancer? Well, hang on, I'm sure you'd know if you've had cancer. No, what a, a stup- doctor has never told me that either. No, never, what a stupid... This is a stupid quiz. I told you it was stupid. Has, has a doctor ever told you that you've had any of the following conditions? Heart attack, angina, stroke, high blood pressure? I think you'd notice, wouldn't you? Well, you must have been told that by a doctor, so you're already yeah. now jumping ahead of me, aren't you? Uh, I was told by a doctor I had acute heart failure. You were told by a doctor you had 36 hours to live, didn't you? I was indeed. Right. I, they said if you hadn't come into the hospital... Well, isn't that on there? You might not have survived the night. No, it's not on there. I'm no. sure if you answered yes to that question, you'd be a bit worried. Right, it says here, in the last two years, have you experienced any of the following? Serious illness, injury or assault to yourself or a close relative? No. I have. Have you? Yeah, well, I've got serious illness. Have you? I've got acute heart failure. Well, you don't act like you've got a serious illness. I've got though. dilated cardio- cardiomyopathy. Yeah, but you don't but act I hide like... it so well. well I hide no, it so well. No, because you don't really look after yourself that I'm one well. of the bravest men in the world. You don't eat particularly well, right? I don't, don't... let people know about my, you know, my terrible um, uh, problem I carry around yeah, with you me don't because really... I carry it inside. Yeah, but you don't really look after yourself. You actually don't eat terribly well. You probably drink more than you should. You don't actually sleep as much as you ought to. And yeah. you work too hard. Yeah, well, I'm not sure about that. Um, I enjoy working. It's a therapy for me, Mike. It's a therapy. You know, all work is, what do they say, reward? Or re- work is reward in itself, is work it? Work is its own reward. Work is its own yeah, reward. Yeah, but the point is, is that that's not good for you in, in yeah. the condition that you're in, surely. You see, now, these next two things they're talking about, these could really have knackered you. Um, in the last two years, have you experienced marital separation or divorce? Mm, not really, no. Well, certainly not in the last two years, but certainly over the last ten years. Uh, well, financial, the last financial, two years. Fin- financial difficulties. In the last two years, no. Yeah, yeah well, no. I think you have. No, I haven't. Oh, I think you have. No, well, you might think that, but I haven't. I've seen you scraping around. Have you? And you drive around with a, in a car with a big dent in the front. It has got a dent in it, yeah, because well, I, well, I didn't want to pay to get it fixed. Yeah, but I, if you didn't have financial difficulties, you'd have the car fixed, wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't. Rather it, than looking no, like the reason some, I don't. No, the reason I don't bother getting you know, it fixed is because, is because yeah. they want about a quarter of the money that I paid to actually buy the car right. to fix it. So well, there's not really any point. Yeah, but you see, you see, I couldn't be seen driving around in a wreck of a car. Because you're a snob. No, it's not because I'm a snob. It's because of my self-worth. I have a huge sense of self-worth. Yeah, but having a nice car doesn't mm. necessarily make you have a better sense of yourself, does oh, it? Oh, no, it does. It well, makes it does me feel if better. If you're shallow, if you're shallow, no, yes. No, 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 I wouldn't drive around in that jalopy wreck that you uh, bring to talk sport every night. In fact, I'm surprised they let you put it in the car park, to be honest, because well, it doesn't do the image of the station any good Well, nobody whatsoever. minds. Nobody minds what kind of car I, I bring to the office. I mind. I mind. I don't like being but associated with it. you've just got that it. little kind of, um, you know, jumped-up C-class Mercedes. Uh, listen, this little jumped-up C-class Mercedes, right, is a fine car in perfect condition in mint um, engineering uh, progress. Excellent
and, and let me tell you, let me tell you, the only reason I ever got it was to find out if Mercedes are better than Jaguars. Right. I and think what's they're the as decision? good. I think they're as good, and I'll be getting a bigger Mercedes very shortly. So don't you start, you know, telling me what you know and you know. Yeah, but Why I do don't, you think? But the point is, I don't, I don't go through my life trying to impress mm. people with the kind of car that I drive or with the kind of, you know, I'm clothes not impressing that I anybody. wear or it's, with the kind of house that I've got. I'm, it, I don't care what people It's think. me feeling comfortable with myself. Yeah. I mean... Look, I don't like to tell the audience this, but four times I've refused to get in that jalopy of yours because I don't want to be seen in it. You know, you've offered me a lift yeah. occasionally after the show. You don't want to be stuff. seen in it? I do not want to be seen in it, It's no. quite high up as well. Yeah, so what? That's probably the other reason you don't want to get in it, well, you have means... trouble getting in it. No, no, I wouldn't have trouble getting in it, you fool, but more people can see me if it's high up. And, I, 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 you know, I don't like looking down on people, and uh, and it's not something I do. But but why do you have this kind of ridiculous psychosis about what, what people think of you? Because that's what your whole life is about. You want to make sure that everyone knows that you no. travel first class. You want no, to make no. sure that everyone knows no. that you've got a nice car. No, I don't care what people think of me. Don't you? I don't care. Are it's, you sure? It, it's my self-worth. Do you mm. know anything about self-worth? Yeah, I do. No, you don't. When I see you standing around on the fire escape smoking a fag, Mm. And ash, you know, falling about your feet, and yeah. you've got your, you it's know, it's going to turn into another kind of, you, you know, free character reading. No, as well, as uh, you know, we have to be honest about each other, and you've got the uh, the lamb's wool jumper on that hasn't been washed for two and a half years. I'm and, wearing a short sleeve shirt tonight. Yeah, well, it's I, so know, cool. I know you haven't got the lamb's wool jumper on tonight, and you know, I see your, you know, your matted hair and your um, your sedate walking pace mm. because you can't actually, you don't even know where you're going in life. So you, you hate haven't... it, don't you? You hate the yeah. idea that I can actually be like that <laughs> well, and still well, be successful because, as far as you're concerned, well, you shouldn't have to be. Well, uh, uh, looking like that if you want to be successful. Well, You've got all these rules that you have to follow. I, I, th- I think it's all about projection, Mike. Do projection, you? yeah. yeah. That's, uh, you know, successful people have a projectionary um, But isn't it image. true that you then project all this stuff onto me because you're actually Why? thinking about what you should be doing and you <laughs> no. don't like the fact that I do things that, uh, no. that you also do, so you make no, out no. that somehow I'm the bad guy. No, no, no. I know exactly what I'm doing. Believe me, I know, I, I know exactly what's going on. Now, uh, I wanted to talk to you, by the way, about um, Olivia Newton-John's house. Why? Well, because do you know about this house? Which house is this? Is the one in uh, Florida. Australia? Florida. In Florida? Florida. All yeah. right. Yeah. What okay. about it? Well, guess what happened? She had the house up for sale. Right. And some workmen came round, right, to um, start working on it. Is it. Have I got this right? Hang on. I don't know. So, have so, you got so, it right? Hang on. I'm checking my details in my fact finder here. Um, yeah, it's a six-bedroom house in the exclusive enclave of Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter Inlet. You Jupiter, heard of that? Yeah, that's where Burt Reynolds used to live. Exactly, that's right. I yeah. once doorstep yeah. Burt Reynolds from the, uh, from the from a boat, actually, down there. Did you? Yeah, right. it's one well, of those places where if you drive into it, it's got, like, yeah. a metal strip underneath the road, and so the guys who are the kind of security guards yes. know every car, every place that it stops. So if you stop your car outside a house, yeah. suddenly they turn up and they go, why have you stopped? Oh. And they move you on. So we couldn't doorstep his house from the road, so we had to hire a boat and actually uh, doorstepping from a boat. That's incredible. You know, we used to work with a photographer in America called... um, A big, tall fella. He used to be a building worker. You're going to give his name away? American guy? Yeah, American guy. Yeah, Mm. yeah. I can't remember his name now. I can't remember his name either. But anyway, um, he became an expert at taking pictures of the Kennedys, Mm. and he did exactly the same thing. He bought a little boat, and he moored it at Hyannisport. Right. And yeah, because you couldn't stop outside their ex- house either, ex- Exactly, and he used to go out in the boat and he'd, he'd, uh, he'd uh, cut holes in the side of the, the boat right. to stick his camera lens through mm. and he got all the exclusive pictures of the Kennedys moving around in right. their compound. Yeah, it's the only yeah. way to get them. Yeah, it's the only way no, to get who them. who was that? I can't remember his name. Do you know the guy I'm talking about? I think so, yeah. He got massive damages off a security company that were looking after Mick Jagger right. because they were doorstepping Mick Jagger's uh, brownstone house, right? In, wasn't it Ron Galello, was it? No, it wasn't Galello, no. Um, and one of the security agents nudged him in the shoulder as Jagger was coming down the steps and knocked him into the basement because the gate was open right. into, into the, the lower floor uh-huh. and he got, he got, like, tens of thousands of dollars in compensation, yeah. But anyway, look... So what happened to Olivia Newton-John's house, anyway? Well, I'm, I'm about to tell you. Now, uh, what happened was... Um, a guy comes in to put the finishing touches to it before she's selling right. it, right? He gets depressed, so he, he commits suicide by shooting himself in the head. In her house? In her house. What, a builder? A builder. Dear me. Yeah. That's yeah. not a very nice story. No, seriously. seriously this building worker's build, working on the house. For some unknown reason, he decides to commit Harry Carey. Right. He does it with a gun, mm-hmm. shoots himself... And ever since then, the house, which is worth six and a half million dollars, has been impossible to sell because of the curse of the death of the building worker. Well, people don't like to buy houses where bad things have happened. Well, do exactly. They? Mm. Do you know what? I wanted to buy a flat once. Yeah. No joke. And um, people got... generally don't tell you, though, do they? I mean, it's quite hard to find out well, if something no, you know terrible how... has happened. Do you know how I found out? How? So I so I go to look at this flat it's somewhere in North London, but I mean quite north, like Palmer's Green or yeah. Enfield or somewhere. You know, it was right. an investment property, and. Um, I walked in with the estate agent and I couldn't believe that there was a half-eaten meal on the table in the kitchen. 
when you were looking at the place to buy it. Yeah. Right, well, was somebody still living there? Well, this is the very point I'm saying. So, so I sort of said to this guy, I said, excuse me, I said, um, is somebody still living here? And he sort of shuffled his feet. He said, oh, no, 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 no. And I said, well, shouldn't somebody have tidied all this How up? How do you explain I, the food, then? Yeah, I, I said, there's a half-eaten meal on the table. I right. said, there's a, there's a plate on the side with crumbs on it mm. and, and, a, and a knife that's all got butter on it. I yeah. said, and there's dirty uh, cups and plates in the, in the sink. I said, well, this is very unsatisfactory. If you're selling a house, surely shouldn't you sort of get well, things Well, you want sorted? it to look as good as it can look, then. Yeah, yeah. I said, this is a very bad image indeed. I said, he said, well, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I'm afraid there's, there's tragic circumstances surrounding this house. And I said, what is it? He said, oh, well, the man who owned it, it was a flat, you know, he yeah. said he was having his tea, you know, a couple of weeks ago at this table here, and he collapsed and died of a heart attack. I said, so what? So what, nobody <laughs> cleaned it up since? Nobody cleaned it up. Like some kind of memorial? Exactly. No, it's just that he lived on his own. Right. And he, he was an old fella, and, and I said, so what? So they came along, carted him off in, a, in a, like, a meat wagon or something yeah. the day, and nobody's looked at it. He said, well, we didn't know he didn't have any relatives. I said, how did you get uh, hold of the keys? He said, oh, it's all a, pro- a probate job. Right. Some lawyer came along and gave us the keys and said, can you flog so me? So did you immediately ask for a discount then? Because I pre- presume that's what you would have done. I immediately did not buy it. Did you not? Do you think I'd want to own a house where a man had dropped but dead? That's, but that's the and, thing. I mean, a lot of houses, people have you know bad things happen to them in, yeah. and you probably never actually know about this, it, This you? guy not only had dropped dead over his tea yeah. in, uh, in this house, yeah. he'd lain on the floor for three days before anybody found him. Postman found him, yeah. Postman yeah, but, found I mean, him how do you know him. when you're buying a house, though, whether mm. something like that's actually ever happened, unless well, you go searching back into the archives? Well, I don't suppose you do, yeah. but if somebody tells you to your face like that, you're not going to buy that house, yeah. are you? No, hey? I don't suppose you are. You're certainly not. You that's know. very worrying. And I feel sorry for living in John now, because she simply cannot sell it. Mm. It's yeah. like when you uh, book, mm. book sort of holidays in hotel resorts and then various kind of places yes. around the world that, you know, mm. some people, you know, if something terrible has happened, yes. you know, they end up going out of business because people yeah. just don't want to go there anymore. Yeah, no, absolutely. Do you remember that? Uh, who was that comedian? Very tragic as well. Do you remember he was watching football one night and there was something wrong with the picture? Yeah. So he went up on the roof to alter the aerial, yeah. fell off the roof and that killed himself. That was Rod himself. Hull, wasn't it? An emu. That was Rod Hull and Emu, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, of tragic stories tonight. Yeah, well, I, you know, I feel sorry for these people because these sort of things happen. You know, life, life can really deliver you a Well, last night you were telling us these kind of things happen with, uh, mm. with bears. There was a lot of action on Twitter earlier on today about your, uh, you know, your bear story and how you should actually manage to fight them off. Well... Which was, uh, there was one, actually, I, I, I got a tweet from somebody I really felt sorry for, and it was a disabled person mm. in a wheelchair, and yeah. said, I'd have a real problem trying to scare a bear off, because A, I'm disabled, B, I'm in a wheelchair, so I've got to make up six feet on the bear. How do you, how do you expect me to do that, Mr Parry? Yeah, and what was your advice on that one? Well, I couldn't advise, could I? It's a special case, so i get longer sticks, I suppose. OK. This is Talk Sport Extra Time. We are the two mites. We've been talking an awful lot about FIFA this week. And do you get the sense, uh, mm. Mr. Parry, mm. I was going to ask you this at the start of the show before you started rambling on about Dick Advocat, yeah. that, that kind of after a while, all of these revelations are just going to kind of go into one big sort of box and, and we're not going to be shocked by them particularly anymore well, until somehow there's some kind of court case and, and people start getting uh, tried and found guilty. I, I totally agree with you there. I think as each revelation comes out, the shock effect will reduce, won't it? Because yeah, so. we'll, we'll get used to the fact that, oh, blimey, you know... Uh, um, nothing shocked us anymore about um, about um, the FIFA scandal. In the same way as mm. in this country now, we're inured to ridiculous situations involving like human rights acts, aren't yeah. we? Uh, and uh, human rights acts, and what's the other one where it, which is abused so very badly in this country? The human rights act is abused badly, and people like um, prisoners in jails are moan about lumpy mattresses, don't yeah, they? Yeah, right, and they want to get yeah. their Sky TV boxes. Yeah, and all e- exactly. Stuff, yeah. And, and what's the other one that's ridiculous? It's it's the PC brigade, isn't it? Yeah, well, I don't actually yeah. mind the PC brigade because I think the well, PC depends, brigade is now been going what the on. PC and about, isn't it? Well, it's it? been going on for so long yeah. now that I don't think uh, uh, anybody actually is out of step with it. And no, the people I, who are out of step yeah. with it actually now look like old dinosaurs. That's well, the well, no, not necessarily. It depends what, you t- depends what you're talking about. You know, when you, you know, when you see these really, really daft things about people being told what they can and can't eat and all that kind of stuff. That five-a-day thing, yeah. I am absolutely convinced... Who's that come that... up with that test, by the way? Is it some kind of government thing? Because it seems what? totally and utterly ridiculous. Because, I mean, if you were perhaps was, yeah. a little bit sort of uh, vulnerable mm. and you might be easily mm. swayed by mm. these kinds of things, if you started answering those questions in a particular way mm. and it says you've got, I don't know, a 20% chance of dying in the next five years, yes. well, that might be quite scary for some people. 
Uh, yeah, but in, then again, uh, I suppose it's to prompt people to change their lifestyle so that the 20% chance of dying in the next five mm. years is reduced to 10% per- percent right. because they start to improve their lives. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, but I mean, nobody really knows what's going to happen in the next five years. I mean, it's impossible to, to, uh, to predict what's going to happen to any individual no, person. No, no, I don't agree. What, why do you say that? Well, because the future is not any, in any way ah, kind of see, planned. This, this it's not is, written down, see, is it? See, this is where our approach to life differs. This is where your approach to life and mine differs. Right. I make things happen. Do you? I set agendas. What did you make happen today? I, I am in charge of my own agenda. What did you make happen today, then, All you do is react to what life throws at you. Well, because that's the right? only way you can do no, it. No, 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 no. People no, used no. to say to me when I was uh, working in newspapers, have you got a five-year plan? Mm. I went, no, I haven't, because there's no point having a five-year plan. You didn't have a five-minute plan. Well, there isn't any point, because things happen to you. How ridiculous is that? And you have to then react to the changing scenario around you. So you you believe in the old John Lennon dogma, do you? Life is what happens when you're busy doing other things. Yeah, I guess so. I That's guess what, I yeah, do. I, I see, yeah. Okay, you haven't mentioned him for a long time, actually. No, well, I just mentioned him now. Utterly ridiculous. You've got, you see, A, when you've got a problem, you've got to hit it head on. Mm. I headbutt problems, because that's the only way you yeah, can Yeah, but you can't get see every problem coming at you, can you? Uh, I mean, for you... example, until you realise that you had, uh, yeah. what's it called, cardiomyopathy, you had no idea that you were yeah. only going to have 36 hours to live. So whatever yeah. plan you had on yeah. that particular day, yeah. you had to scrap it, and but you what, had to come what, up with a new one. Yeah but, yeah, but I react to situations. What did I do when I suddenly found I did only have 36 hours to live? I don't know. I then started putting a plan into place to make sure I lived longer than 36 hours, a even if it was only plan. 72. Right. Even if it's only 72 hours. And then right. once I got 72 hours, then I thought, I'm going to stretch this now to 144 hours, mm. you know? And then after I got 144 hours, then I was going to stretch it to a week. You see what I mean? Right. And I presume now you don't have to think like that because you, I have to think a bit pretty, like that. you're pretty much back to normal now, aren't you? No, I'm not anything like normal. Well, don't you think you could live in a much more healthy way, though? I do live in a very healthy way. I mean, I know way. you walk a lot, but, yes, you know, yes. like I was saying to you, you don't really look after yourself aside from that. I do. I don't know what you're going on about my diet for. My diet's very healthy. I don't eat anything that's got fat on it. I don't eat saturated things. I eat things which are good. I mean, you mock me for eating kippers, but kippers are oily fish. Right. And oily fish, in fact, makes your bones What about uh, the fish and chips better? that you have at least once or twice a week? I don't have fish and chips once or twice a well, week. Well, you, you had fish and chips on Sunday because you sent a picture out from Witherspoon. That was once in three weeks. Once in three once weeks? Once in three weeks. Was it? Once in Sometimes three weeks. You have it twice a day, though. Uh, if I do, that's once in six weeks. OK. And, by the way, eating fish fingers on their own is a very, very nutritious food. Yeah, you don't and think that's bad for you. I though. don't eat them with chips or right. anything else. Mm. I don't eat shit. Listen, I want to talk to you about food right. for two things, two reasons. I want to talk to you about food. I'm glad you got onto it, right? First of all, chimpanzees now have been taught how to cook. Apes, <laughs> apes, uh, chimpanzees have been taught how to cook. Well, yeah. they already knew how to make tea anyway, didn't they, from this, the pizza the, chips ads? This is a scientific report. You know I study my science journals all the time, right? Chimps like chips... Um, and the fact they do means humans are not so special after all. An experiment has found the apes prepare, uh, prefer cooked food, so much so that they will even save raw food and put it in the cooker themselves. Will they? Apes can now put food Where in cookers. Where have they cookers. done this study, then? Uh, let me see. This study, has been, this study comes out of uh, the Royal Society which is a study published... Um, the Royal Society of what? Just the Royal Society? Well, the Royal Society is a scientific institution. Oh, it's it? based in London. Oh, yeah, okay. you should know that, but, of course, you don't. No. And, um, and what the apes are doing these days is what Stone Age man did. Mm. Uh, in their compounds... So there's a lot of these apes somewhere in a, uh, a lab somewhere inside the Royal Society building? No, no. Well, they, where are they doing the study? Well, they send researchers to places like Rwanda. Well, and they put a cooker there, do they? No, they don't put a cooker there. Well, how you, do they you know, know what they do with a the cooker, then? It's not a cooker. What it is is the the apes invent a cooker with stones. All right. Because if you if you put a load of stones together in the hot midday sun mm. in Rwanda, yeah. the inside of the stones gets very hot, and apes realised this. So, so they've actually they, made an oven. They made an oven. They make mm. they make ovens. Okay. The apes make ovens, and they put the meat in the ovens, and they make cooks. That, so it's honestly. like a stone baked kind of oven. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's very much like that. Very much like that. And uh, also, all the information from the Royal Society was sent to Harvard University, which we know well. Right. Have you ever been to Harvard? I have. Yeah. Yeah. It's brilliant. Isn't Several it? times. Absolutely I used to, well, I used to go to Boston an awful lot when I was in New York. Actually, yeah. For yeah. one reason or another. Yeah. I used to get up there. And uh, what's and Yale? Have you been to Yale? Yeah. You I have. Yale, My sister yeah, lives very close to Yale. Actually. Does she? Yeah. Does she? Just really, down the road. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Good. Um, also, also, it's not just meat that uh, apes now cook. They cook their potatoes, sweet potatoes. They stick them in their ovens as well. Are they vegetarians? They, these apes then? No. Of course they're not. How can an, uh, an ape be a vegetarian if it's sticking meat in the oven? Well, I don't know. Yeah, well... Some apes, I mean, some monkeys are vegetarians, aren't they? Um, Isn't that the point? Chimpanzees? The difference between apes and are monkeys. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, look, what I was going to tell you was, um, in one experiment under controlled conditions yeah. that you asked about, they, put, they did put an oven in a room with a load of chimps. 
And uh, after a few hours, the chimps realised the food tasted better when they put it in the oven and took it out again. Chimps were actually using ovens. Well, chimps are very smart creatures, aren't of course they? they are, they yeah. They can learn. But, yeah. I mean, they're very close to, uh, to humans. But, I mean, presumably they don't care if it's heated up or not, do they? Yeah. What they what say... Mean, yeah. Sorry? You didn't listen to a question that, that I just yeah, asked you. Yeah, your question was, they don't, they don't, they don't care whether it's heated, whether it's heated, up, heated or up or not. not, do they? They do. Really? Yeah, but what, what it says here is, the one thing holding back uh, apes and chimpanzees from becoming as competent at cooking as humans right. is sourcing the heat. The only source of mm. heat for them in the natural world is the sun. Is the sun. Whereas we can light fires, and they haven't yet learned how to light fires. How about yeah, that? I suppose that's what makes the difference that? between, uh, between uh, the apes and, and men. But well, I suppose it's it is. A, I mean, it's another kind of pointless study, really. What's the point of knowing that? For no, example? it's not a pointless study, because it's all about evolution, isn't it? Is it? Because what I, I, I said to you at the start of telling you about this, um, this scientific uh, research, right. that they think it's linked to the way Stone Age man mm. developed his culinary skills. But Stone Age man discovered fire, didn't he? That was what yeah. kind of made the yeah, difference. Well, yeah, well, Stone Age what, what man and, and other animals, because there aren't any other animals that can make a fire. No, that, that's exactly right, and I think what this uh, this survey is suggesting is mm. that the next move for the chimps and apes of this world is to discover how to create fire. But isn't that the point of evolution? Because evolution stops mm. in certain species, doesn't mm. it? They don't actually learn how to do it. They, you know, they've learned everything they're going to learn. So if they don't learn any more, then they're not evolving, are they? Well, I think they are evolving, aren't they? If they if they get more and more clever all the time, which and every scientific study I see on apes and chimpanzees, you know, I mean, we're big supporters of. Um, free, How's the old free uh, Tommy, Tommy the yeah, Chimp? Tommy the Chimp. How's that going, by the way? Well, it's going very well indeed, and that's what I'm saying. And and as more and more people become aware of the high intelligentsia level of. Uh, mm. Do you know what? I'm I'm absolutely certain that Tommy the Chimp is is brighter than a lot of humans who are what I in what I call the uh, the underclass of, the underclass. of society. Well, you know. The people you refer to as scumbags. No, 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 no. Those who've not had the benefit of a great education sometimes drift into the trap mm. of um, of the welfare society, yeah. which, which can be a terrible But that doesn't imposition. mean they're not bright. That just means they haven't had a good education. They could still be just well, as intelligent as anybody else. I don't think their brains have been developed, you see, no, uh, because, see. because a brain develops when you've got to make decisions for yourselves. Yeah. If the state just gives you loads of dosh, and says, go and spend that on fags, beer, uh, kebabs. Well, they don't actually say that, do they? Well, that's the implication, isn't it? You know, keep you happy. Mm. You know, I mean, if you think about it, the welfare state is like a sort of monetary cosh, excuse me, to keep um, people who haven't got a job, you know, sort of happy. It's stopping them. It, it, it's basically stop a peasant's revolt, so to speak, um, if it was the 14 or 1500s. You're going to get, you're gonna get more uh, grief for this. No, no, get no, no. Uh, tweeting us in and saying, no. you know, you're ranting on no. and giving you right wing views again. That's I, what I'm not, say. and I'm not calling anybody a peasant. What I'm saying is. In the Middle Ages, there were riots because people didn't have enough food, mm. OK? Yeah. So and that was called... Now the they've got too much food, of course. Yes, that's right. It was called the Peasants' Revolt. So what I'm saying is the modern-day politician throws money at the welfare state in order not to um, create conditions for the destabilisation of society. But it doesn't happen, does it? Because people still feel kind of uh, locked out of the whole... Pri- uh, possibility of becoming anything at all because they're known as by people like you as the underclass and that's why it's not good well, for them. Well, no, but I didn't create the word underclass nor, the, nor did I create the conditions in which a person enters into the underclass because, uh, you know, people don't go there voluntarily. They're, they're sucked into it. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. problem. That that's the problem. problem. That's that the problem. problem. It's not their fault. Well, maybe you should, give them, people, a, maybe you should un- give them a stone kind of, you know, yeah, a you stone... Know. Um, uh, uh, Oven to work with. And Under, underclass learn people can be good people, believe me. Well, of course me. they can. Yes. Of course yes. they can. Yes. Uh, he is Mike Parry. I'm Mike Graham. We're going to talk about the uh, Champions League final coming up very shortly. Uh, we've got loads of other stories in the papers I'm going to ask you about as well, okay. actually. Uh, and of course, the Coronation Street quiz yes, good uh, is idea. coming up uh, a little mm. later on in the show as well. This is Talk Sport. On DAB, Digital Radio, and 1089 and 1053 AM. The pressure's on now. Relieve the itch. Talk Sport. <laughs> I've been to Louisville, Nashville, Knoxville, on Babaka, Shepherdville, Jacksonville, Waterville, Coastal, Rima, Pittsfield, Springfield, Bakersfield, Shreveport, Hackensack, Cadillac, Fond du Lac, Davenport, Idaho, Jellico, Argentina, Domitina, Pasadena, Catalina, see what I mean. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Across the desert, it's bare, man. I breathe the mountain air, man. I travel, I've had my This is Talk Sport Extra Time. We are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a little yep. bit later on, of course. Mm. And uh, there is a, a little live show coming up on Sunday night as well, isn't there, here yeah, in yeah, London. If yeah. you go uh, to the two mics.co.uk, uh, you find out where you can get uh, uh, tickets and all sorts of things like that. And uh, it's where right. else are we going as well? It's in the West End, St James Theatre. They're looking forward to it very much indeed. And honestly, going to have a, a real, real laugh and, and a great, great night. You'll enjoy it if you come. And if you don't, hope we'll see you sometime soon. Because we're now, going to a lot of other places as well, right? Well, at the moment, we're booked for 
for uh, Manchester, Newcastle, yeah. and towards the end of the year, yeah. well, I don't think we've um, actually um, spoken about this before, we're going to go back to um, the Repertory Theatre in Birmingham and we're going to do the full house oh, okay. with 800 people. So I'm looking forward to that. Details Excellent. on that soon. Right, now then, um, what I want to say to you, pal, was this. Look, we've travelled quite a bit. We've been very lucky in our jobs and all that kind of stuff, right? So I always love these surveys which say, you know, what are the, uh, the world's top cities? Yeah. And I particularly love it when they're talking about the top tourist cities, and I particularly love it even more when the top tourist city is given as London. So this is the city that most people come to, or from, the city that from most the rest of the spend, world no, spends the it, most money in, right? It, no, it's the it's the city it's it's the city um, the most numbers come to, right? And the 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 biggest uh, visitor centre in the world now is London, with eighteen point eight two million people coming every year. Which I'm is not a six percent increase actually, because on every last time year. you go anywhere into the centre of London yes. now, there's just tourists absolutely all over the well, place. You I, can't move for them. Yeah, but Mike, it's very difficult these days to tell the difference between tourists who are passing through yeah. and residents who are foreign people who've decided I don't to think settle it. Is. No, I don't think it is. You don't I mean, think it like, is? If you're on a tube, for example, you can always mm. tell the tourists because they stop at the wrong points, they don't sort of get off the train well, at the that's right true. point, they don't get on the train at the yeah. right point. Yeah. They, they come down escalators and stop at the bottom. You become uh, mm. actually like this kind of crazed New York person, yeah. which used to happen to me when I was living in Manhattan, where you'd get people who stopped on the uh, street corner, opened up a map, yeah. and you'd be walking oh, so right. fast to kind of get around it. You'd be like, just get out of the way. Yeah. And, but London's become really, really saturated with tourists, and I can't believe that so many people come here because it's so expensive. Yeah, but it's also a fascinating city. It see, is. see, I was working today down near Tower Bridge, uh -huh. and I got a cab back from... It's beyond Tower Bridge. It's, uh, it's actually down towards your way, Tooley Street and all that, mm. you know what I mean? So, so I, I get a cab back, I come over Tower Bridge, and the magnificence of the Tower it of is, London yeah. is just... Well, there's something about a, a river that goes through yes, the middle of the city as yes, well. Yes, that's, that's is, uh, right. And we don't realise living here how lucky we are, right? Yeah. So London's number one, fine. Right. So we've, obviously we've been there. Right, number two, Bangkok. Not only have we been there, we're actually, we were actually in it as well. We're in it. We're in it. We're in it. We're, as we speak, folks, we're in it, and we looked out the window here, we could see the London Eye. Well, we can't now because it's pitch black, but, I mean, we could if it was you daylight. You could if yeah. it was daylight, yeah. yeah that's yeah. right, yeah. And uh, what else are we close to? We're close to Waterloo Station, named, of course, after the Battle of Waterloo. Although I did see some Americans one time yeah. in Waterloo Station who were asking where they get the name of the station from. Is it from that uh, that pop group in Sweden? Oh, really? Seriously, yeah. I'd yeah. never heard of it. They didn't know there was a battle at Waterloo. Mm. Um, so, anyway, look, uh, you're absolutely right. Now, the second city that attracts more, listen, uh, more um, visitors, and right. I cannot hardly believe this, is Bangkok. Yeah, I've never been to Bangkok. I've never been to Bangkok. Uh, there's a great song. Who, who made this song? John will know if One I find him Bangkok. Uh, yeah, um, Bangkok, Oriental City. Is that you, One Night in Bangkok? One Night in Bangkok. That's right. Is that you know, the one? Yeah. Do you Murray know? Head, I think the guy's name was, was it? No, I think it was um, Chanson de Moore a lot. Sean... Not Manhattan Transfer. Manhattan Transfer, I really? think it was. I think it was. I've no idea. I think well, it I'm was. sure John can find it. But anyway, I've never been to Bangkok because I don't like... I, I, I have no interest whatsoever in the East. None whatsoever. Why not? I don't want to go to Vietnam, I don't want to go to Thailand, I don't want to go to Bangkok. The place I really don't want to go to is... Wouldn't you have gone that way when you went to Australia, though? Didn't you stop off somewhere like I've that? stopped off uh, on the way to Australia in Singapore right. and in somewhere else. I don't know. I've never been to Hong Kong, you see. I'd I've, quite like, I'd... I mean, I'd quite like to go to Bangkok, but I've just never had any kind of inclination well, or need to do so. Do you know why I would never go to Bangkok? I'm too frightened that I'd be used as a drug mule. Really? And uh, yeah, uh, well, you think yeah. you might get conned by somebody to oh, carry a statue sh or something like that? Well, you'd probably buy something ridiculous, wouldn't you? No, 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 no. It would, they're much more subtle than that these days. What they do these days is they, um, if you're in a, like a top hotel and all that, one of the cleaners will be a drugs mule, mm. and they'll like stitch drugs into um, the bottom of your, your your suitcase or something like right, that so you while you're not looking. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. right. They'll do things like while you're out. Okay, but couldn't they do that anywhere though? Well, yeah, but Bangkok is a, is a drug centre. It's yeah. where it's the Golden Triangle. Yeah, where was called. where was Midnight Express based? That was Turkey. That was Turkey. That was Istanbul. Yeah. yeah. Right now, what I'm saying is, I've heard amazing stories about you know when you're in Bangkok, you go out for the day, you come back, and while you've been out, one of the cleaners who only got a job as a cleaner because they're really a drug dealer yeah. would have hollowed out the heels in your shoes and put drugs in them. Really? Yeah. And then and then what? Doesn't seem worthwhile, does it? Unless they well, uh, put them in all your shoes, you'd be like hundred well, pairs well, of shoes. Well, well, you know they might have do hundred pairs of shoes in the same hotel every yeah. day. And the point is, when you get back to Heathrow 
amazingly, you can't work out why people have stolen your shoes and all mm. this kind of stuff, you know, no. and it's all that kind of stuff. Bizarre. Mm. I didn't know that sort of thing happened. Oh, it anymore. happens all the time, believe but, me. So why would you think that that would happen to you, though? Well, because I think they'd pick on me because I'm a sort of, you know, a distinguished individual, you know what I mean? They probably sense the... I'm not joking now. They sense the air of authority about they me. They would think that I'm perhaps not... you was one of those people that uh, would go through without exactly, being questioned. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, man of a certain age, swanning through I customs. I once got there. stopped going, uh, coming back mm. from customs because I'd been to India. Right. And I'm sure that yeah. they tried to target certain you know, sure flights and certain... And I was quite young. I was only about 21 or something sure. like that. And I'd been out there actually working. Yeah. And I'd brought back a load of newspapers because we were in the newspaper business. Right. They went through absolutely everything. Yeah. And they singled me out as somebody that they obviously thought was uh, was carrying something illegal, which I wasn't. Yeah, but you see, you see what happens is, you see not aware of this, and I am. Somebody could have reported you for bizarre behaviour on mm. the plane. They might have done. Now that means because you had too much drink. Or I don't think. Like I, that, I don't think I had mean? actually on to that. To try and quell your nerves because you were going through customs with drugs and mm. all that. Anyway, let's move on because. Yeah, okay, what's number three? Paris. Paris. Now, Paris. Yeah. No. No. Have you been to Paris? Or I have been to Paris quite I, a lot. I love yeah. Paris. I, I love Paris. I think it's brilliant. Gare du Nord. Right. You know, Gare du Nord. Yeah. Gare du Nord. When you get off the train, mm. the uh, the star, and I, I sometimes stay with the first night Paris in a little hotel opposite called the Mercure, right? Oh, yeah. Which is a beautiful old hotel it's got it's got a spindly um, staircase that mm. goes round and up like that right. and at the top there's a bar overlooking you know the um the sh- the uh, well, well, just, Nord. just the Gare du Nord, yeah, that's yeah. right yeah but i i stayed once in the hilton right next to the eiffel tower i love paris i love the architecture love that the is known as the paris hilton isn't it that's where i stayed as well paris I stayed hilton. There once, yeah. yeah that's right mm. yeah it is it's the same name as the girl paris and hilton. paris has got that same thing as london with the river and all that and, stuff yeah, absolutely on. right and on the champs elysees my favorite paris uh, restaurant is called fouquet yes you know you've mentioned uh, this before yeah, yeah, last time yeah. i was there actually i came across kind of entirely by accident mm. this kind of uh, princess Diana and a memorial, right? Where the uh, you yeah. know where the tunnel Over is, the where, tunnel, where, yeah. where, yeah. where she, yeah. where she yeah. died. Seen it, seen it. And mm. I, we, we were there for a long time. Once I was the correspondent for the Rugby World Cup. The Rugby World Cup. Yes. You know. This is and, why and, I'm quite surprised you've never yeah. really picked up any French. Yeah. You've never really managed to kind of master the language, have you? Well, not master it, but I get by in French. Don't worry about that. Yeah. And I would walk every morning from roughly the area around the. Um, uh, Arc de Triomphe uh-huh. to roughly the Eiffel Tower. Right, yeah, that's quite roughly. a long walk. Here's a long walk, it's a long walk, and some, some. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? You know, bit of Edith Piaf. Edith, Edith Piaf. Yes. Right now, the next one is. Thank you very much. That's great. Next one is Dubai. Dubai. Been to Dubai. I have been to Dubai. I've been quite Dubai. a few years ago when mm. it wasn't anywhere near as big as it is yeah. now. Yeah. And uh, the funniest thing that happened to me there was basic. Well, there was loads of funny things that happened. Mm. But when I went to the cab driver one morning and said, "Look, I haven't got much to do today. Can you take me down to the old market and right. the old souk yeah. in the old town?" And That's he was right. like, "There isn't one." He said, "It's only been here since 1972." What, Dubai? Yeah. I've been on the souk in Dubai. You've been on the souk in Dubai, it doesn't surprise me. But there isn't actually an old town, No, 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 you fool. This is a boat that you get on. You have lunch on the boat as it goes up and down the well, waterway. the souk is the market, though. That's oh, not I thought boat. the souk was a boat. No, the souk What's the not... boats called? Well, I don't know what the boats are You know, are they're called. special boats with sails. Oh, they're dows on Dows, the dows, that's no. right, not the souk. It's like a souk. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. You sit on there and you go up and down this false waterway. Right, now the next one. Istanbul. Istanbul. I haven't been there either. I went there for an England game. Yeah. And I've been there for... I've been there actually for two or three football matches. But the England game, I remember, was we went... We had a lovely hotel. In fact, I tell you what, we were there for four days. Mm. And Mr Brazil, we did the breakfast show there for three days, yeah. never left the hotel in really? four days. No, we just didn't leave the hotel. Didn't actually go out at all? Didn't go out at all. No, he didn't go onto the streets of Istanbul. It's an exciting place, isn't it? It's quite exciting because it, it, it bridges uh, Europe and Asia. Yeah. Um, and, and Is there a place where you can go and like stand and have your picture taken with one foot in either place? Yeah, no, not really, because it's, it's a huge bridge across the Bosphorus, yeah. which, uh, which links the two. But what we did do is, right, well, first of all, my, my worst memory of Istanbul is mm. we were out doing a live broadcast outside and... Uh, a load of little kids came running around, yeah. messing around, all that kind of stuff, and I, you know, cuffed their ears and told them to get lost, you know. Because, of course you uh, did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then a little kid about uh, 20 yards away started waving at me, you know, and I you know, give him a rude gesture, you know, to right. get lost. And then he was I'm waving... I'm amazed you've not been then, sort then, of taken into custody yeah, of yeah. these places that you've been. And, th- and then he waved a, a mobile phone at me. Uh-huh. And I wondered what he was doing till I went to get my phone and realised he'd stolen my it phone. It was yours? It was my phone. And what, he'd pickpocketed it? He, he, he'd stolen it. He'd stole, I'd, I'd put it down while we were doing this outside broadcast interviewing some fans or something, right. you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and then we had to negotiate. I had to pay him 50 US dollars to get it back. How about wow. that? Well, that's uh, uh, being an entrepreneur, I suppose, if you're a kid over well, there, isn't it? But anyway, the other thing about Istanbul is that was where I realised 
what the Cold War was all about. It was be, no, it wasn't the Cold War because the, the the wall came down. Anyway, look, what it was happened? After was, eight, no, 1989. Yeah, oh, it was, it was way after that. It was this is uh, this was about 2005 or six or something. Yeah. And um, and what happened was we went right up onto the top of the hill on the Asian side. Where there's a restaurant. We got in there, but then the the owner of the restaurant pointed out. This was where the Cold War was fought mm. because the Bosphorus, of course, leads into the uh, Black Sea. And into all those Caucasus-type states, right? That's right, into Russia and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And every boat that went past was a spy boat mm. going out on a spy mission for Russia. Right. It was amazing. By the way, um, somebody mm. has also asked me to ask you this because you were yeah. so much in praise of Russia last night. We yes. were talking about you know, whether the World Cup's going to get taken off Qatar, whether it's going to yeah. get taken off yeah. Russia. And you gave this kind of amazing speech in, uh, in sort of, uh, support of Russia. Like you had somehow been uh, been got at, and people are asking no. me to ask you why. No, not at all. Well, why are you suddenly so fulsome in your praise of Russia when you've talked before yeah. about you know how kind of you know difficult Mr. Putin is, as you refer well, to? Well, I him. think Mr. Putin's a strong leader, and I think I think he stands up for his country more than Western leaders stand up for their countries. I really do, and I also think that the current tension between the East and the West is down to the fact that the West are trying to steal parts of Russia. For the common market, right. what would you do if, if if Russia suddenly said, right? And this 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 could be a fact. Mm. If Russia said, look, not only do we want East Germany back, we'll take West Germany with us, because that's effectively what the what Europe is saying to Russia. They're saying, I tell you what, we'll have a, a bit of uh, the Ukraine. Mm. We'll have a bit of that. Well, the Ukraine is very, very Russian. Well, parts of it are, anyway. Parts of it are, but it's, it's associated with Russia and the yeah. Soviet Union. It's not associated with Europe, is it? No, but some of the people no. that are living there want to be part of Europe. Yeah, well, in that case, divide the country in two. No, that's okay. not what he wants to do, though, is well, it? Well, I'm telling you, what he doesn't want is a, is, is a land snatch for, for the, um, the Europeans to suddenly... And the other thing is, I mean, he is suspicious of democracy, and we like democracy yeah. in Europe. But they're not used to democracy. You can't impose democracy on people. Look what happened when we tried to d- impose democracy on Libya. And why are we having this geopolitical speech? Anyway? I don't know. We right. got to Istanbul. That was right. where now, the Cold ne- War began. Right, next one um, is off. Save time, by the way. Don't even we're worry about the time, time when we're we'll we'll doing this, this list. On later. Right, New York is number six. How about that? No, well, that's obviously. What do we know about New York? Don't have to city, talk about it? it. We don't have to talk right. about it. We'll have to do the rest in a minute, though, okay. because uh, the time is uh, very much against us. Can't you get the time schedule right? Well, because you know, every 10 minutes or so, we have to stop, and unfortunately, you don't seem to have a clock in your head. That is the problem. He's uh, Mike Perry, like I'm Mike Graham. We've got the quiz coming up uh, very, very shortly. This is Talk Sport. <laughs> Apparently, it's from the musical Chess, this song, right? Remember, remember Chess? Yeah, that's, that was written by uh, the same guy who wrote all those uh, things with uh, Lord... What's his yeah, name? Yeah, Tim Rice, wasn't it? Tim Rice, Tim Rice, and... Uh, and um, who was the music uh, guy? The Andrew genius. Lloyd Webber. Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah, Lord but Webber. I think he did this one on his own. Lord I Lloyd Webber. It, I remember it opened in New York and didn't do yeah, very well. Yeah, but he well didn't write that song, did he? I don't know. No, I don't think he did. It was Murray Head who performed it. Anyway. Was it? Okay. It was not uh, yeah. uh, Manhattan yeah. transfer. Now, listen, Duncan in Leicester just says before it was we... Murray Head. Porky the Plank uh, gets it wrong again. Murray Head. Yeah. Strange name. Yeah, very strange. But um, you know, Murray Mint, Murray Head. I don't know. Uh, listen, just before we go on, we've had a plaintive uh, plea here from Liz, Liz Hilton. She's a big fan. Okay. Yes. She she gets a little um, uh, spiky sometimes, you know, delivers a few insults to me. I think she's really... Uh, Fancies herself as the uh, first Mrs Parry. Well, I think, I think that's her problem. I think she knows that, uh, you know, until she is um, sort of confirmed in mm. that role, yeah. I think she's, she's all over the place emotionally. But she says, I don't want to buy a ticket for your show on Sunday, just leave my name on the door. Uh-huh. What do you think? Well, that's entirely up to you. Well, is it? Yeah, I think so. It's a joint decision here, isn't it? Yeah, well, I don't think it's one we should make on the air, though. No, OK, fine. Thank you. OK. He is, is, uh, of Mm. course, uh, Mr Parry. He's been to how many? Three uh, Champions League finals, uh, as we can say. I've personally been to one. Mm. Uh, We're going to talk now to Matteo Benetti, uh, who's going to be uh, telling us how Juventus are going to shape up against Barcelona. They've got one big injury problem, though, unfortunately. Matteo, very good morning to you. Welcome. Hey, how are you guys doing? Uh, very good. And uh, obviously, this news about Giorgio Chiellini has been making all the front pages. But what I think about it is probably uh, going to go against uh, public opinion. Uh, I-, I think that Juventus are actually in better shape without Giorgio Chiellini in the lineup. Oh, OK. So do you think they've got a, a realistic chance? I think they do have a realistic chance. Obviously, Barcelona are favoured, but uh, it's going to be Andrea Barzagli playing in his place. Barzai has been probably the best Italian defender in the past two, three years, ever since he joined Juventus from Wolfsburg and has somewhat, uh, you know, really had the best seasons of his career in his 30s, like what we've seen from 
Andrea Pirlo. And uh, Barzagli, the biggest problem is that he hasn't played that much this season. He's coming off a very serious injury. He only came back to full fitness uh, a month and a half ago. Mm. And even now, he has a niggling problem. So uh, Leonardo Bonucci, the other center back, he's been excellent this season. He was actually once considered to be the weak link of this event, the starting 11. And now he's been their best defender. Uh, and, and going back to the Chiellini thing, guys, uh, I've, I've watched him every game this season. He is very prone to making a mistake. He likes going up against very physical number nines, very big strikers. He's had some incredible battles over the years with Ibrahimovic, Edinson, Cavani, and other big physical number nine. But when you put nice. him up against very technical strikers, mm-hmm. the likes of Neymar, Messi, Suarez, that like to run at the defender, then mm-hmm. it's a completely different story. He gets very nervous. Uh, very anxious, and he's prone to making stupid mistakes, uh, challenges that lead uh, to cards, that lead uh, to penalties, and we've seen uh, a fair share of blunders from him this season. Mm. And one of the things I suppose that uh, people were not necessarily looking forward to, but one of the kind of side stories was obviously him uh, playing against uh, Luis Suarez, and that's now not going <laughs> to yeah. happen. But uh, that, I mean, that would have been uh, an interesting thing just to see how Luis Suarez has kind of moved on from sure. uh, from what happened the last time they saw each other. Yeah, I mean, if Luis Suarez ever bites somebody, I'd be incredibly shocked. And uh, really, it, it would have set the internet memes that light, right? All the stuff we've been seeing on Twitter with all the fake pictures of Suarez biting Chiellini. But uh, the real storyline is now, who's Allegri going to start at the back? Is he going to go with uh, Barzagli or Angelo Gbona, who's another centre-back they have, who hasn't seen too much time either? So it, it makes things very interesting, guys. Uh, Barzagli, he reads the game very well. He has excellent anticipation. He's a completely different defender than Chiellini, who's your rough and tough, a very aggressive. You know, he'll always dive into challenges, not afraid to pick up a card. Meanwhile, yeah. uh, Barzagli, much more classy. He reminds me a lot of uh, Alessandro Nesta in terms of his defending. He reads the game. He sits back. He's very patient. So a completely different defender. And uh, really, I think this is going to be one of... I've, I've never been intrigued for a matchup uh, like this in years. And, and how about the timing of, of, of this kind of announcement about the injury as well? Because maybe there is a bit of, uh, I don't know, shall we say, uh, public relations at, at work here. So everybody says, oh, now Ju- Juventus aren't going to be as good. They're not going to be as strong. But in fact, from what mm. you're saying, actually, um, it might not be the case at all. Yeah, it's interesting. Even Gianluigi Buffon said, listen, we had a 35% chance of uh, winning against Real Madrid, and we did that. So chances are we have an even lesser chance than that. Uh, So he's putting Juve's chance, the goalkeeper, uh, at less than 35% chance to win. Uh, No one's going to say that Juventus is your favorite. It's clear that what Barcelona have, the best attack uh, that I've ever seen in my lifetime, going up against this Juve side, which has been very solid, but... You know, they've even got a little bit of luck, as you need luck to, to advance in the Champions League. Remember, they were uh, basically even keel with uh, Monaco. They almost didn't advance, had a very hard time with them, but uh, they play very solid defense. Uh, that midfield that Allegri has, four box-to-box midfielders, which are going to run hard at Barcelona. They're going to bring the high pressure and try to negate that possession uh, style of football that, uh, that Barcelona likes to employ, obviously you know, shutting people down in their own half and just dominating, dictating the play. So what do you think it's going to be in the first half? Is it going to be a kind of, um, you know, a waiting game? Uh, obviously, yeah, it's going to be an onslaught, obviously, isn't it? Obviously, I mean, Barcelona are just going to come <laughs> at them. I mean, we've seen Barcelona play this way so much in the yeah. Champions League. Yeah. Where they, they just don't let the other team get yeah, the ball. Yeah, but, Mike, they, sorry, mate, they, they've scored 120 goals there, uh, their strike force this yeah. season. What, why would they wait? Yeah. Why, why, why would they play a waiting game, Matteo? Uh, that's, these are all good points, but I don't think they've gone up against a defense quite as good as the one Juventus mm. have in mm. all of La Liga. I mean, if you take a look, Barcelona had the best defense in La Liga. If you, if you look at the numbers of goals that they conceded yeah. and also the way they played, the fact that they give the ball so uh, little away to the other side, and the, the other side usually doesn't even see the ball. But mm. with Juventus, I expect them to sit back. Uh, Allegri's going to start the game very patiently. He's going to bring a high pressure on uh, eventually. He's going to play four midfielders that can run back and cover so much ground. Mm. I think he's going to go with Vidal, Pogba, Marquisio, and Roberto Pereira. All four of them can change position. All four of them can defend and go forward and score and help mm. out Tevez and Morata, who I expect to be 
uh, the two front men. So yeah. uh, I, I don't think this is going to be lopsided at all. I've, I've heard on Twitter people saying this is going to be a blowout. There's absolutely no way that Juventus, the way they play defense, the way they close themselves down, is going to make this a blowout. I think it's going to be a very even game, much more uh, than a lot of people think. I, I, Matthew, I have to disagree with you. And, and I disagree with you because at the start of this season, everybody said it won't work. You know, the, the, the trio of Neymar, Suarez and Messi, even Johan Cruyff who was the manager who brought Barcelona their first ever um, uh, European Cup. Mm. They won at Wembley, didn't they, uh, in, the, um, in the 70s, was it, or the 80s? And, um, and even he said, oh, it don't work, you can't put these three men together. And what's more, and this was jo- Johan Cruyff's view, he said they've bought too many forwards at the expense of not buying good midfielders because the great Barcelona teams of the past have been built on great midfielders. But this is the classic, the absolute classic example of a team being so good at attacking... They don't need a defence, and they don't need defensive midfielders. They're just going to go and steamroll any team they play, and that includes Juventus. Uh, see, I, I completely disagree. Obviously, we're going to have well, to wait until Saturday. Well, we'll Saturday, have to agree to but... disagree. But believe me, the proof will be in the pudding on Saturday night. You'll be on, the, you'll be on this station on Sunday morning. you ring ringing in to say he was right. Parry was right. He got it right. From oh, the start. He, might, he might say that, or he might not say that. But yeah, you, you, you pronounce Barcelona three different ways there, which mm-hmm. is the actual correct version of Barcelona that you're going to go with. Isn't it? Barcelona. Barcelona. Yeah. Thank you very mm-hmm. much indeed. It is live on Talk yep. Sport, of course. Yep. Uh, I'm Mike Graham. He's Mike Parry. Uh, we've got loads more coming up. I've been to Louisville, Nashville, Knoxville, Long, Babaka, Shepherdville, Jacksonville, Waterville, Coastal, Rapid, Pittsfield, Springfield, Bakersfield, Shreveport, Hackensack, Cadillac, Fond du Lac, Davenport, Idaho, Jellico, Argentina, Domitina, Pasadena, Catalina, see what I mean. I've been everywhere, man. This I've is Talk Sport Extra Time. We are the two mics, we and yes, uh, we're yes. still doing this uh, this uh, round the world with Mike Parry thing, are we? No, no it's it's the favourite cities in the world yeah. of visitors. Now, the reason I insisted on coming back to it is because yeah, you cut it off at the moment. Well, because we thought... ran out of time, because no, no, as no, usual, no, you were no, no, rabbiting no. on about no, all no. sorts of things that uh, nobody's no, really interested no. in. No, it's getting embarrassing for you, because you've got the list in front of you like I have, and the next city no, we're going to No, I'm writing them down as you're telling me them. No, no. So New York was the last one, right? Yeah, yeah. So what's the next one? Well, you see, this is why you stopped talking about them, it's Singapore. Oh, is it? Right, and okay. your shameful episode in Singapore, when you run I've off only, with your well, doxy... I've only been there once. You, you, oh, yeah, only, only gone there once, but you took your doxy with you, you left your wife at home... That's a terrible word to your use. Wife at, why? why well, that's is it not terrible? a good word to use. Why? Why? Well, because it's not a, a respectful word to use, is well, it? Well, hang on, I'm sorry, how else do you describe the woman who was your mistress who you took off to Singapore when your wife was at home... Well, not as a demanding, doxy. ...demanding that you get sacked by the Daily Mirror because of your... Um, immoral behaviour. As a matter of fact, we'd already separated at that point, actually. So oh, I'm once not sure again, about you've that. got it wrong. I'm not sure about that. You went to the uh, Raffles Hotel and I drunk... I did. Uh, how many, how many uh, gin slings? Well, not as many as Mr Brazil did when he went there and broke the record. He did, actually, yeah. 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 Was there a tiger under I think, the uh, uh, it was something table? Like, yeah, well, I, I don't remember, actually. Mm. I, I didn't stay at Raffles very long because I thought the drinks weren't particularly great and uh, the atmosphere wasn't particularly brilliant. I, I totally agree with you. It's a very austere place, isn't it? Very, no, very well, touristy. Well, I, well, I I thought it was the other way. I thought it was all panelled uh, wood walls and yeah. all that kind of stuff. It right. didn't, didn't attract me What at were you all. doing in Singapore, anyway? What was I doing in Singapore? Did you Singapore? go on your own, or did you take anybody with you? No, was no. Was it another one of, you know, Mike Parry's world tours think, of freebies? Uh, did think... you go on a freebie? No, no, not at Did all. you pay? Uh, well, of course. Did you? And I stayed at the... Um... Shangri-La Hotel, which right. is the best hotel in Singapore. Okay. I was on a stopover on the way to Australia. I was there for four days. And the Shangri-La Hotel, I think I've told you this before, is the only hotel in the world I've ever stayed in where the headed note paper in your room actually has your name on it oh, as right, well. Yeah. So I wrote to all the people in the world who I hated most with uh, this fantastically embossed... See, this is the trouble uh, with you. You see everything as an opportunity, paper, to, uh, you know an opportunity I mean? to kind of show yeah. off. Uh, well, That's, I just... I mean, if I was to describe mm, you in, in, yes. in a couple of words, I'd yes. have to say you are a bit of a show-off, aren't you? No, I'm not. You do no. quite like showing off. What am I showing off? Well, you talked about you having a nice car. He talks about having well, no, a nice you place keep talking be... about that, not me. Yeah, not but me. to you, that's important. That's the point. Well, I think it's better to be respectful of a nice car than an old wreck. But, but nobody what... else, I mm. don't think, that I know would mm. go to a hotel in any part of the world, yes. find that they had their name written on a piece of uh, notepaper, yes. which is clearly the thing they do for every guest that stays there, and then yeah. write off a load of letters to people you don't like to say, look yeah. at me, I'm in Singapore at this well, really expensive it, hotel. It was kind of a, it was a, it was a socially engineered revenge, if you certainly Yeah, mean. was it? Right. But, I mean, you want to see this paper. It actually says, you know, Michael Parry, Suite 421, the Shangri-La Hotel, right. you know, Boulevard... Yeah, but uh, they do that for anyone that stays there. Well, I don't care about anybody else. I mean, this, to me, was, you know, it was a, an acknowledgement of my role in life, I 
and my status mm. in society. And it made you feel good because you were suddenly staying somewhere that was, as far as you were concerned, you know, kind of above your station. See, I think in the end... No, it wasn't above my have, station. It was equal to my station. inferiority complex Equal to my station. On. But we shouldn't be talking about me in Singapore. We should be talking about you. No, well, we shouldn't I mean, because I was I'm, there I'm for about three days. I'm surprised you ever came home after the shameful episode that went on no, there. I was only there for about three days. It was a very, very short trip. I went actually for the Singapore um, Food Festival. No, enough. really? Yeah. yeah, I bet you had plenty of that. Uh, I did eat quite what a lot of food. What sort of food do they serve in Singapore? Well, the, the chilli crab is the most famous thing that they do. I went to... I, I, every night, actually, while I was there, I went to um, the What's Her Name uh, Cafe. What, what's the name of cafe? I you, don't know, know. you know, we had one in London once with all the guitars on the walls and all that. Oh, and hard Rock. Hard Rock. I went you went to the, to the Hard Rock? Yeah, every night, yeah. Well, great. that's not exactly very local G- cuisine, well, is it? Well, no, but it's the sort of food I like. What, you had hamburger and chips the whole time you were there? Yeah, I did, yeah. And when I was in, uh, for instance, when I went to uh, that place in Mexico where they dive off the cliffs. Yeah, Acapulco. Acapulco. Right. I went every night to the, um, the Pizza Hut. That's ridiculous. Because I, I don't know why I you bother like, going like, anywhere. I don't like Mexican food. I don't, I don't, I don't know like why you food. go anywhere at all. Well, no, to me... Singapore is like the, mm. the meeting of all these different kinds of uh, Asian cuisines, basically. They've got Malaysian, they've got Indian, they've yeah. got Chinese. I don't like any... Got... Well, I like Indian, I like Indian, yeah. I well, like... you should have found a place I like a bit to of Chinese kind of as well. Yeah, but I like the Hard Rock. Yeah, the atmosphere was in great. It had a jukebox. There was nowhere else in Singapore had a jukebox. So it was great. put the Beatles on. I did, yes, I did, honestly. it was. I felt I felt like I was in heaven eating eating a burger and chips in the Hard Rock Cafe in Singapore with. Uh, the Beatles uh, booming out of the speakers. Oh, Unbelievable. Great. You might yeah. as well have stayed in London. Yeah. So what's the next one then? Because that's, uh, what's that, number five or yeah, six? Uh, that's number seven, Singapore. Is right. it? Kuala Lumpur. I haven't been there either. No, I haven't either, and I don't want to go there. What's that the capital of? Um, uh, well, it's Malaysia, isn't it? M- uh, Malaysia, is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't want to go to the east. Next one, Seoul. Now, who would want to go to South Korea? I haven't been to South Korea either. Well, that's another part of the world. I didn't do the World, world Cup in 2002. Uh, yeah, I haven't been to Seoul Well, either. I did do the World Cup in 2002, but I was in charge of a massive operation of other people there. Mm. I was actually heading things up, you know what I mean? Right. Did you see that story, by the way, mm. about North Korea, where the, uh, the, the US Defence Department sent by accident a load of anthrax to all these, uh, <laughs> these laboratories in North Korea? Oh, oh really? And they said, oh, it's a terrible accident. Yeah. Uh, don't worry about it. Everything will be fine. Well, what do you mean they sent it to them? How did they well, send they it to them? Well, they apparently sent it to the post, apparently. Well, they posted a load of anthrax files yeah. to North Korea. Right. Well, that's a bit provocative, isn't it? Well, you would have thought so. Yeah. I mean, kind of a stupid mistake to make, really. Yeah. It's a, bit like, um, it's a bit like when the Americans sprayed Agent Orange over Vietnam. It wasn't a good idea. No, but they had to cut down all the, uh, you know, the, the, the heavy, you know, forest they, they to and, try and, and foliage and all that, didn't they? They had to try and deforest the um, the banks of the rivers yeah. because the Viet Cong guerrillas were using the cover of the trees to right. attack um, American shipping. But well, there were lots of things that were done in those days that nobody thought was actually going to be dangerous, do, but do it turned know, out to be terribly dangerous. Well, you know, spraying Agent Orange over Vietnam killed about 2,000 American soldiers yeah. anyway who got cancer when they killed home. Yeah, exactly. Including, actually, funny enough, funny enough, including the opening sequence to the first Rambo film. What do you mean, the opening sequence? Well, you know, he's on this road and he, he looks like a stumble bum and he, and he walks through this town and he goes to see his mate mm. and he brings out the picture and he says to his mate's mother, who's a, a black woman pegging out her washing in the back yard, you yeah. know, he was, uh, you know, you know how that Stallone speaks. You know. I've forgotten how it starts, <laughs> actually, because I only yeah. remember how it finishes. Oh, well, I'll tell you how it starts. He goes, uh, hey, hi, uh, my name's uh, John Rambo. And he came to see Rocky, or oh, what his name was, you know, Billy. Go to see Billy. Is Billy here? And his mother says, no, he ain't here. He's gone. He's gone? OK, when's he coming back? You know, we're together in Nam. Ha, oh, ha, Green Berets. Yeah, ho, oh, oh, ho, where's Billy? He ain't coming back. Why not? Has he left? Where's he gone? The Agent Orange got him. And that's the opening sequence. Is that the opening sequence? Yeah, oh, because he, he, about that. he died of... Uh, that's he, not a bad he, Rambo accent, actually. Thank you. That's uh, your, uh, by the way, somebody told me my impersonation uh, the other night of John Carver yeah. with my Geordie accent was the most brilliant they've ever heard. Well, I haven't seen anyone say But for some brilliant. unknown reason, somebody said it, it, it tripped out of the uh, the podcast the following day, which oh, really? I find, you know, Did you discover why that had happened? I don't know. You know, these things happen. I mean, there's only so much you can put into a podcast, mm. so I suppose you've got a little bit squeezed out here and there. I mean, well, I don't you know, know. But I didn't see anybody problem. on Twitter. Twitter actually saying that uh, what you'd said... By, no, they uh, did. No, they said my John Carver no, was... No, said it was the worst brilliant. North East accent anybody had ever heard. No, it wasn't. I'm not going to do it again now because, you know, I need time to work up mm. to it, but it, but it was very good. Uh, and so what's Mar- happening at Newcastle, by the way? I should ask you that question, shouldn't I? Because, uh, you know, what's going on with John Carver and uh, uh, the situation up there? I don't know, but I think we'll invite him to our show up there, you know, just to cheer him up a bit in case... Uh, you think you need to cheer him up? Well, I think he will do it by the time we get up there because, I mean, all the information we are getting out of Newcastle, which isn't a lot, is that he's going to take a step backwards into mm. the coaching role he had before he was made uh, acting manager, isn't right. it? 
Yeah, I think so. Isn't he? Well, I think Steve McLaren's going to get the job. Yeah. So none of us have been to Seoul and don't right. want to go to Seoul. Good. And then the last one's Hong Kong. Well, so it's very. I haven't been to Hong Kong I, either. I've been to Hong Kong. I've got no interest in Hong Kong. My brother-in-law, it was you know for a long time involved in um, leather and all that kind of stuff. Leather you know, import export. Yeah, right. leather goods, bags, all that kind of stuff. And he used to go a lot to India and he used to go a lot to Hong Kong. And he swears by Hong Kong in the way that you and I swear by New York. You but know Hong what I mean? Hong Kong's not known for its leather goods, is it particularly? Uh, there were other things he dealt in, which were in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's a huge commercial centre. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, you know, he equates Hong Kong to our New York. You know, like, we know New York's made up of five boroughs and Manhattan's an island and all that, and you've got Long Island. And he can reel off all the old, you know, Kai Wan, Kai Lun and, Kowloon, all that kind of, yeah. Kowloon and all that kind of stuff over there. And he says it's just as so good. So this list that you've given me, basically, yes. we've been to New York, we've been to Paris, we've been to London, mm. we've been to Singapore. That's about it, really. And Istanbul. Uh, well, I haven't been to Istanbul. No. So out of ten places... And Dubai. I've only been to, I've been to five. So yeah. I've been to about yeah. five places yeah. each. Yeah, and by the way, I've just remembered, I've been to four Champions League finals because, of you? course, I went to the one in Rome where I fell off the cliff. Oh, yes, of Remember? course. Yeah. That was a Champions League final it as well. It was, indeed, yeah. Excellent. Now, coming up, uh, we've got the uh, Coronation yep. Street quiz. Yeah, I've sent out a tweet on that telling everybody to stick around because I, I feel so confident about this one it really you know I'm not I'm not uh, being um, uh, trite here but I am masterful on that subject well it's something that you should have been watching pretty much all your life well right? yeah but except for the years we lived in America right. when there was no Coronation Street there so I had to pick up on it when I got back but mm. I still feel very confident about it do you I'm very confident indeed yeah okay all the major moments and all that I mean the last few episodes you know uh, just recently have been about a fire mm. and people dying in fires and and seemed to be a lot of fires in Coronation Street a lot of people seem to die in them and all there seems to be an awful lot of those kind of dramatic yeah, lines yeah, but i mean you yeah. were saying in porky vision the other night that it, the, the, the storylines are getting a bit daft so i hope i hope you're up to date is all i can say oh yeah i'm, I'm well up to date don't worry the the other thing is i realized after this fire thing right now one person who knows the truth mm. is now in a coma right and that plot is the third time they've had it in coronation street in the last two and a half years well it's think it's been going for so long that presumably no. some of the plots just revolve well, around well what it? i'm what i'm saying is the the plot's the same for the third time in about two and a half years um, somebody who knows the truth is in a coma in hospital. Yeah. The person who is the villain keeps trying to get into hospital to pull the plugs on the person who's in the coma right. so they die, mm. so they can't wake up and reveal the truth. Yeah. You see what I mean? Well, after a while, it must get more and more difficult to come up with new stories. Well, I suppose so, yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose it is, yeah. But, it, you know, I think that's getting a bit repetitious now. But anyway, all will be revealed in the in the Coronation Street, uh, street quiz. No problem at Coronation all. Coronation Sweep quiz, yeah. S- street, um, street. Did you see, talking of fires, did you yeah. see uh, Ed Miliband yesterday standing up in the House of Commons talking about uh, uh, coming back to politics, which everybody thought he wasn't going to come back for a long time? Didn't, didn't he say, Keep my eye on everything. Yeah, well, like, he, we well, should all be very grateful. Yeah, well, he wasn't so much mm. that, but he was given a lot of sort of uh, you know plaudits for coming back after having such a, a terrible, terrible loss. It was a big piece in the Guardian yesterday about what oh, went yes. wrong for Labour and how awful the I whole didn't campaign see that. was. Was that a good piece? It was a very good yeah, piece. Yeah, it's okay. quite long, but yeah, it's well worth yeah. reading. Well worth reading. Yeah. Um, but he, but he was. I, th- I thought mm. he actually did himself a few favours yesterday, and he yeah, actually okay. said uh, that one of his kids had kind of brought him back down to earth by saying to him that uh, you know uh, if we have a fire here, Dad, mm. it will be okay because uh, when we ring the fire brigade, they'll come quickly because you. Used to be famous. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah, well, that's good for him. Um, what I was going to say is that maybe, yeah. maybe he'll be a much more effectual backbencher, mm. you know, working on committees and all that kind of stuff, than he was trying to lead the party. Because right. he never looked comfortable in that role, he really, never did. did he? And if you read this piece in The Guardian, it looks as though actually the, the infighting that was going on between all sorts of different factions right. was never very comfortable for him to be uh, sort of lording it over either. No, and there was absolutely. all these different people trying to tell him one thing, other people telling yeah. him something else. And it looks as though inside the Labour Party it's complete and utter chaos. It just broke moment. apart. Now, uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you about, uh, right, uh, very quickly is that I believe that Tesco listen to this show. Tesco's? Yes, I believe they do. When you say Tesco's listen to the show, yeah. you don't mean the kind of, you know, um, the, the chief executive of Tesco. Well, what do you mean the people on the tills well, of Tesco? What do you mean? One, one of the, one of the um, stories that we've told uh, over the recent months yeah. is my charitable work down in Portsmouth when I hand out drinks to the... Um, when you handed out the stale beer to the down now. Well, it wasn't stale beer. It was beer that was, was a bit out of date. Old beer. Oh, oh, OK. I, but instead of throwing it into uh, a bin, which I could have done, yeah. I took it out and handed it out to the down and out, you know, and the they people were very grateful. who had dr- uh, clearly had drink problems. Yeah. But I think it's good to give down and outs with drink problems beer because most of the time they drink very cheap wine and whiskey. So I'm weaning them off right. um, the hard well, spirits only if you do and it on the a regular basis and and, and and the the uh, wine, which is so fireproof, it's probably tearing their guts mm. out. So I was actually helping them out by um, weaning them off on uh, out of date beer. What a decent man you are. Well, the thing is, out of date beer probably doesn't taste as, as good as in date beer. So they'll probably think, I don't know why we drink this. You know. So so have you got more out-of-date beer to hand out? Is no, no, 
no, no. The point I'm making is that uh, I learned today, uh, I learned this from Tesco, thousands of tonnes of, of Tesco food is to be given to charity at the end of each day now, oh, rather good. than being thrown away. Excellent. How about that? Yeah, well, I think they've got right. a uh, law for that in some countries in Europe where they're actually not allowed to throw it away, are they? No, they actually no. have to give it away. Guess how much food goes to waste in this country? And bear in mind, there are people around the world starving. Um, Tesco has admitted in the past discarding 55,000... 400 tonnes, tonnes yeah. of food every year, 30,000 tonnes of which is perfectly awful, good to eat. It? Absolutely well, shocking. You know, you know when you see, like, a, um, uh, an oil tanker and all that kind of stuff? How an much, oil tanker? Uh, yeah, how much do they weigh? Uh, I don't know. I think they weigh Why about 100... what an oil tanker weighs? Because I think an oil tanker weighs about 100,000 tonnes. It depends so, what's on it, I So suppose. what I'm saying is, Tesco are throwing away every year, at their own admission, enough food to fill half an oil tanker. Mm. Just think about that. I mean, if they if they put all that food into an oil tanker and sent that oil tanker to the Sudan, yeah. that would keep the Sudan going for about four years. Well, it wouldn't because it'd be gone about um, uh, sort of a week, and all the food would go off, wouldn't it? No, you'd freeze it all. Freeze you'd put the it on, food. Put it into a freezing oil tanker, and then and then it'd be frozen by the time it got there. And by the way, did you know? Did you know? This is like your story about taking ice to the no. uh, to the Africans as well, isn't well, it? It's a good idea as well. Did you know that because of climate change? Mm. Um, which you know, which the green lobby told us told us was going to ruin the world mm. and all that. There are areas of the Sahara now in which palm trees are growing, really? where there hasn't been a blade of grass for three hundred years. That's due to climate change. Maybe they've been there all the time. No, they haven't. No, 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 no. There's rain in the Sahara now that never was before. That's a result of climate change. Really? Climate change is good. Have you seen the time, by the way? Don't worry about the time. When We've I'm telling you how I know about the world being safe. This is Talk Sport Extra Time. We are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on this morning. I've got a couple of uh, texts that have come in which okay. uh, would suggest a bit of bad news for you on the Corrie front. Right. Uh, both John in Blackpool mm. and Steve in Sheffield uh, have pointed out that the guy uh, that you said was in a coma actually died earlier in the week. Who? The guy in Coronation Street who was in a coma, who's got mm. all the answers, apparently died earlier mm. in the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, that doesn't suggest yeah, he that he died you're... in a fire, as um, I recall. Well, no, you said he was in a coma. Um, no, that was a. I think that was a woman. No, really, it's a woman who's in the coma. I oh, think. Okay. I think it's a woman. Let well, me just think. Let me just think. Hang on. I'm trying to think who's in the coma. Um, well, whoever's in the coma is no longer in a coma. They've died. Oh, that was a girl. It was a young was girl. It? She was hit by a blast from the builder's yard. Oh, okay. Her name was. Um, I can't remember her name now. Oh well, never mind. She, she had. She had. But a, it doesn't bode well though for your expertise on coronation. She had a so. lesbian relationship with. Um, uh, uh, Sally Webster's daughter. Did she? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, well, hold that you know, thought because we've got the. It's a long running story. Well, but we've got the Coronation Street quiz coming she ran up into, in a little while. She ran into the fire and got blown away. Yeah. Mm. Now I want to I draw your attention because of your great knowledge of the last England Island game. Yes. You were of course uh, working for the FA mm. at Police Fear Return of Hooligans ahead of Irish Game is what it says on the back page of the Independent. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. Uh, this is all part of this uh, story that's been going on for a while. And what does it where, say? Uh, well, they're basically saying that uh, mm. England supporters are being urged not to sing anti irish Ray songs during this Dublin friendly. Why, why would you want to sing an IRA well, song? Well, you in would Dublin. rather hope that that would have come yeah. to an end now, wouldn't you? Well, uh, to start off with, it won't be the same sort of people. I think I read that the the travelling fans have been restricted to three thousand. Yeah, which isn't a lot in a big stadium. Yeah, but as you know, that doesn't necessarily stop people from getting to. Well, it's not a very hard place to get to. It, Dublin, remember, it? it's a friendly game. Yeah, I, you know, there's no huge uh, axe to grind in this one. They, yeah. I, I know the last one was a friendly. Yeah, but the the point of the last one was it was an important game because um, England weren't playing any competitive games because they'd already... they were hosting the... They were hosting 96 yeah. and, right. and, and they'd already got there. You're absolutely, mm. absolutely right. Um, and also, Matt Letizia made his... I think his first start for England. And, uh, you know, um, Terry Venables has been under a lot of pressure mm. to um, to give him a start and all that kind of stuff, so he, so he did. I, I also read somewhere that um, Jack Charlton is going to be an ambassador at this game on uh, Sunday. Right. Uh, and he's 80 now, Jack, and mm. he's not in the best of health. Right. Um, I spoke to somebody who, who'd seen him recently, actually. Mm. Um, but but he was a manager, of course, of the Irish team that night. Terry was a manager of the English team. But I can't, I, I just can't imagine the mentality of somebody going to Dublin and deciding, oh, I know, why don't we try and stir up, you know, hatred between the Irish and the English by singing anti-IRA songs? Right. I just don't get it. Well, one of the things that is said in this piece here uh, by yeah. Ian Herbert is that uh, they've been sort of profiling some of the fans that have been getting mm. involved in some of this type of singing over uh, some yeah. of recent games, and they've said it's a kind of a younger crowd of people who are probably mm. unaware, perhaps, of the significance of it, and they're just doing it because they think it's kind of, you know, well, a bit of a laugh and they're not really sure of how, um, you know, kind of no, sensitive some I, people I, are I, about I, it. I totally agree. I totally agree that the, the ignorance factor is uh, is a huge contributory 
a reason why you know people go around mo- you know mocking and taunting others, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it's just sheer ignorance. And but it brings us back to that do. conversation we were having earlier about uh, in the week about Jack Wilshire, mm. right? And you know when I was talking to the guys on the sports bar about you know why should it be necessary to hear come, some of these horrible chants that you do hear when mm. you go to football matches mm. because. There's always going to be, I suppose, an element of, of fans who are going to think that that's funny or clever yeah. or whatever. But it wouldn't, wouldn't it? I mean, I don't know how you eradicate it, but it would be great if you could eradicate it, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, of course it would. I totally agree with you. And, and by the way, um, it, uh, the guest on Sports Bar, um, David James, a goalkeeper, yeah. who um, he touched on the thing that oh, people used to write headlines about me, you know, playing uh, uh, on a computer 16 hours a day. Mm. I remember him being in an England squad that I was associated with right. when he sat on a couch all day at the. Um, uh, the Belfry right. the, in the Midlands where the golf course is mm. the England team was staying there with a Game Boy it right. was a Game Boy in those days wasn't right. it it was, yeah, a, hand, it was, it was yeah. a handheld computer yeah. he sat there for hours and mm. hours and hours playing mm. it I mean he, you know he did have a big interest in it I remember that as a, I witnessed so it so you're myself. the one that leaked the story then about that no. what you used to do no 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 of course not no no I dampened down stories suggesting yes. that there was anything wrong with any England player don't no worry about that but he made a very strong point uh, David James about Jack Wilshire mm. and the reason I mentioned that is there's pictures all over the papers today of the England team training over in Ireland Jack Wilshire's prominent amongst them and he said it was totally unse- unacceptable what mm. he said. Uh, Andy Goldstein sort of, you know, shown some sympathy for Jack Wilshere's position on on the grounds that he thought, well, you know, young man who's a bit vociferous didn't use the worst language in the world. But no, David James wouldn't have it. He said, no, no, no. He said if that had been indoors at, a, at an Arsenal fans meeting, mm. fine. You know, just about acceptable, but not in the public to people standing in the street. And I, I, I'm of that view as well. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah. well, hopefully the game will go off mm. without any uh, any difficulty. Um, but uh, apparently the police are sort of on guard that anti-social mm. behaviour has been creeping in. They say disorder started creeping back in on the night of England's abandoned game against Poland in Warsaw in 2012. Mm. And uh, you know that's when um, they've started spotting that there's sort of yeah. pockets of some yeah. of these fans that may not be official fans, may not be going in an official capacity, but somehow get into the games anyway. Yeah, I think. It's it's quite clever to have a one o'clock kickoff. It is one o'clock, isn't it? The yeah, it's an afternoon yeah. one, yeah. Because you know what a drinking city Dublin is. Yeah. And any England fans going over there, even though, by the way, I travelled with England for about three or four years, mm. not, you know, um, working for Talk Sport, not right. in a capacity as, as, as their director of communications or anything. And the vast majority of England fans that I came across, and we came across hundreds, if not thousands, yeah. you know, we interviewed them, we went into the squares with them, we went into the fan zones with them, we went into the stadiums with them. I, I never saw I never saw a single England fan in five years mm. who was out of order. Seriously. Well, that's like the vast majority of football I never fans. Saw, I never I mean, saw one majority. being arrested. No, I never the, saw the, one drunk. That's the, thing, the vast majority yeah. of football fans yeah. in, in any league that you want to pick out, mm. of, uh, out of the country, mm. up and down it. Um, and the vast majority of f- football fans are very yeah. well behaved as well. So, so if uh, if any fans are going there for trouble, they're going there specifically for trouble. Mm. They're, they're, it's not part of the culture anymore of the travelling England fans to no. get in, into trouble. You know, I mean, the disgraceful scenes of 20 years ago at uh, Lansdowne Road, mm. which, by the way, was a stadium ready to be torn down. Yeah. I've never seen such a dilapidated international stadium in mm. my life. It was a disgrace, you know, built over a railway line, so they always said, well, we can't expand it and all that kind yeah. of stuff, you know. It was an, it, no wonder they re, they wrenched the chairs out and started throwing them on the fans below. I mean, they did them a favour by. Well, I don't think it was quite doing them a favour, but well, it was probably easier to do with a, a dilapidated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aspect. But what I'm saying is, you know, if, if if any good came of that disgraceful night, it was the fact that you know Lansdowne Road needed tearing down and rebuilding mm. because perhaps not in that way though. No, perhaps not in that way. I totally agree. The problem is if you throw chairs, you know, they were trying to throw uh, um, benches and chairs yeah. on the pitch. Right. But they didn't have a very good aim, mm. and they didn't have much strength well, to also, launch. Yeah, them. but also so, they were all put in a, a, a sort of a, a bad place as well, so they could actually chuck stuff down yeah, on well, people they, below they, them. That's what I mean. It was all landing on the people's heads below, mm. you know, and all that kind of stuff. So, so it was. Yeah, it was a it was a disgraceful uh, episode. But there we are. Yeah. Well, uh, well no. Ha- when I say there we are, that's too trite. What I'm saying is we've got to make sure it never happens again. Mm. I, I don't think it'll happen this weekend. I'm being, crossing my fingers it won't, because I tell you what, if it does, it will take back. International football relations, mm. decades, absolutely decades. It really will. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that mm. in, the, in, the, in the week when uh, you know, sort of, we've got international games coming up. You know, yes. the whole focus has been on internationals, and I mean, I've seen uh, mm. quite a few tweets and texts from people over the course of the last mm. week or so mm. uh, talking about FIFA and saying, "Well, you know what? We're not really as interested in international football mm. as we are in club football, anyway." So, yeah. you know, it, this would be a good opportunity for uh, for England to kind of you know raise the flag and go, "Look, this yeah. is what international football is supposed to be about. It's not supposed to be about getting paid compensation exactly. for." Uh, you know, losing games. It's not supposed to be about, you know, bribing officials yes. to try and get the World Cup into a particular place. And and in the end, mm. actually, it's mm. just about uh, having a good time. And hopefully yeah. it'll be a great game. And, uh, you know, mm. we'll all watch it on uh, on Sunday afternoon. The... Where are you going to watch the Champions League final, by the way? Uh, I don't know yet. I don't know. You don't know where you're going to be? No, I'm not sure. 
I, I haven't got a massive interest in it. Really? Because I find it difficult to concentrate for 90 minutes on a game that doesn't involve England or an English team. Right. You see what I mean? I do. Or even my team. But it's supposed to be the pinnacle of European football, though. I will watch it, but what I'm saying is, you know, if it was a game in which I had a, a divine interest, I would have organised some sort of a party. Would you? I'd have had people round, mm. there'd be drinks flowing, right. there'd be some food and all that kind of stuff, you mm. know, make a real sort of uh, beano of it. Yeah. And I'm not doing that. I will watch it, but I will watch it probably in solitude and, mm. and make my own assessments of what I'm seeing. In solitude? See you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah maybe. Excellent. Yeah, okay. why? why? What's, well, have you got a problem with solitude? No, I've, well, I, just, I, just, I think you do a lot of things in solitude, which I think is partly why you kind of uh, end up coming up with these Lots of people ideas. do things in solitude. i tell you what's happening at the moment, right, mm. and I've noticed it because, of course, I'm a student of the national press as well as everything else. Yes. An awful lot of women writing at the moment about the benefits of being a spinster uh -huh. because some lady has written the definitive book on, you know, I don't need a man and all right. that kind of stuff and she's, she's never got married mm. and all that kind of stuff. I don't know who the lady is, actually, because I don't read a lot of the women's sections, but there is something like that going on. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you what it is when I find it, because I, I, I'm sure I can is find it. Is it your, uh, amongst your papers there, is it? No, 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 no. but it's, 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 in my, uh, it's in my list of notes somewhere. And this lady has written it saying, you know, don't think that you're odd because you are single. Mm. Um, don't think that it's bad to go along to, like, your friend's children's christening as a single person right. because it's not and all that. And that has provoked, right, this has provoked... A load of other women who are spinsters, yeah. as opposed to being divorced. You see and, what I mean? So people who have never been married. People who have never been married right. are coming out now and saying, "This is my lifestyle choice, and I will not be criticised for it." I don't think there's anything wrong with it necessarily. What, what, what do you mean necessarily? I don't think there's anything be, well, wrong with it necessarily. How condescending is that? How condescending is that? A woman who chooses to grow up in life without having to use a man as a crutch mm. to to lean on. Uh, if you see what I mean, yeah. and um, and uh, decides to make her own way, earn her own money, live her own lifestyle, do her own thing without having to relate to another human being. Why are you dismissive of that? Well, I'm not. I just said I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. You were condescending. You not said I don't think there's anything wrong with it necessarily. Yeah. What's the necessarily bit? Well, the necessarily bit is because there are lots of people who would be critical of, say, your lifestyle because you're why? Uh, living why? on your own. Why? Uh, why? Why? How can anybody be critical of my lifestyle? I don't offend anybody. I don't hurt anybody. You offend loads of people. I don't go around, you know, beating people up. I don't go around. Um, Stealing their seat on the bus. Right. I don't go you around. Don't go on the bus. I don't. You know. I don't. Uh, I don't. You know. The very worst people are people who poke their nose into other people's business. Mm. You know. Have you ever? Have you ever been in a pub when some joker has come over and and, and tried to start a conversation with you? Yes. Or the very worst thing I hate. Do you know what I hate? What do you hate? Do you know, I absolutely hate. If I go into a pub and I've got two folded over newspapers, yeah. right. And I put them on the bar like that, and I say, oh, I'll have a pint of London Pride, please. If the barman then takes more interest what's on the front of the newspaper than pouring my drink, I take the papers away. And I say, oh, I said, haven't you read the papers today or something like that? I find you that always, highly offensive. You seem to always be getting into trouble in pubs. No, 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 no. about that no, no, up, because the, the time is, is against us. The, the, yeah, but I'm, I need to tell you about the pub etiquette, you All see. Right. You don't know anything about pub etiquette. I don't know That's anything your about problem. pub etiquette. No, I don't spend my life in them. But, however, uh, we've got the Porky Quiz coming up very soon. We'll hear some more from uh, Mr Parry about pub etiquette next. On digital radio and 1089 and 1053 AM, Talk Sport. <laughs> For extra time, we are the two mics, and uh, we're now going to be treated to, I think, uh, a little lecture in uh, pub etiquette from Mr. Mike no, Porky Parry. No, Parrot. no, no, no. That's I what said, you said that... you wanted to tell me about. Yeah, but if I tell you about anything that I think about pub etiquette, you just mock and deride. Not at all. So why should I? Well, because what you're always telling me is how you get into rows with guys behind the bar because they talk to you yeah. and ask you how you are, yeah. which, well, you well, well, that, well, which you seem to take exception to. Well, uh, they now shouldn't. Now you tell me that shouldn't. you don't like it if they look at your newspaper. No, I don't. You I don't, don't like it if somebody comes up to you when you're sitting in a quiet corner on your own and tries to start a conversation with no, you. No, I don't. But yeah. what's wrong with that? Well, it's, it seems that you're slightly intolerant of other people. Then, no, I'm it? not intolerant. I just wish to um, they for them to respect my uh, individualism yeah. as I respect theirs. Mm. OK? Yeah. What about this one here from Freddie? He says, uh, oh, I know where uh, old Porky's going to be on the night of the Champions League final. Uh, it doesn't really matter about the location. They'll be in some bladderation situation uh, for the Champions League final. That's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? Yeah, mm. I don't think you're going to be out watching it. Mm. I mean, judging mm. by what you've been saying, you'd rather watch it in solitude on your own. If you're watching a football match in a pub, it's yes. better if you've got a load of people with you, isn't it? Yes, but then you have to do what they do. 
um, what you have to do is you uh, have to jump up and down when a goal is scored yeah. and pretend that it's all. And also, you, you know, have to have that kind of thing. You're terribly enthusiastic you, you about also, it. You also have. I mean, there's like mm. quite a lot of um, sort mm. of European football bores around, aren't there? People who oh, know yeah, everything yeah. about Juventus. Yeah, and yeah. know Everything about Barcelona. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, and if they've been supporting Barcelona for kind of you know five or six years, they're complete experts in it. And yeah. you're an absolute philistine if you don't know anything about Barcelona or you don't like yeah. the way they play football. I totally agree. I even think even, I think there's a bit of that with you. It, no, no. Even though I know a lot about Barcelona, I don't uh, always want to get into that sort of. Um, Company. Now, listen, I've researched my notes here. Yeah, OK. And this woman is called, right, yeah. who's written name? this book about spinstership yeah. and, and says, you know, you know, don't be ashamed to be a spinster, it's great. And her name is... Uh, what's her name? What is her name? Uh, I don't know, actually. But, well, I uh, thought you said you found it. I, I have found it. I have found it. And uh, Your sorry. notes are in a bit of a shambles, aren't they? They're a bit of a shambles, I'm That's afraid. Said. Right, i tell you what. i tell you well, what. What's the name of the book? Can you at least tell us the name of the book? The name of the book is... Uh, now, let me see. What have we got here? Right, here we go. Her name is Kate Bollock. Kate Bollock? Yeah, seriously. Are you seriously? I'm, se- I'm serious. Kate Bollock? <laughs> no, no, How no. are you spelling that? No, it, uh, B-O-L-I-C-K. Kate Bollock? Kate, Kate, yeah, Kate Bullock. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, okay. Kate Bollock, you know. Kate I mean, I mean, well, I'm, I'm, uh, look, uh, do you have to be smutty? Well, I mean, it's that... just a ridiculous name. After waiting well, all that time, I didn't expect you to come out with that. Really. Well, it is her name. Right. And she's US author, right? right. And she argues that not all women want to wear. Well, see, in America, that's not a word that people use, is yeah. it? Yeah. No, and uh, her book is called Spinster. Right. Right? OK. And, uh, and, and what she does is she goes into this... You think this. with a name like that, she'd have wanted to get married so she could change it? Um, well, you know, not necessarily, I suppose. Some people are born with unfortunate names, aren't they? they are. I, I always think... I mean, I know this is horrible and it's a family show and all that, but there is a sports writer on The Sun. I'm not sure if he's still there, but he was. Uh, his name is David Facey. Yeah. And I always thought, oh, golly, you know... What What's wrong with that? Well, you know, Facey's and... You know what I mean? What? I, I, well, you well know, no, that's a completely different sound, though. Well, but it always, I mean, you know, we'll know the names that, you know, um, you know, promote humour and mm. lavatory humour. Like, yeah. I hate all that. Yeah. So if I had a name like that, I would change it, I'm would afraid. You? I'd, yeah, I, I'd, mm. I'd, 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 I wouldn't be strong enough to put up with the mockery that you'd mm. be subjected to all your life. Can you no. imagine, you know, when you're at a school playground and yeah. all that kind of stuff, you know. But anyway, there we go. We mustn't dwell on that. It's not her fault she's called Kate Bollock, no. but she is. And she's written this book called Spinster. And there's, <laughs> right. So what, so what uh, are the sort of... Have you got are ten you going to minutes? laugh every time that I mention this? Well, it's just the way you say it. What do you mean? Well, it's the way you say it. You could, you could kind of put, put a, uh, an inflection on the second syllable and make it sound less what, like Kate Bullock. Kate Bullock? Yeah, Bullock, yeah. Well, Kate like Bullock. Bullock. It's like, it's like when, it's, it's like when um, you meet somebody mm. who's called Onions. I what? They're not Onions, they're Onions, aren't they? Onions? Yeah, you meet uh, some bloke called Bill... I've never met anybody Bill, called Bill Onions. Bill Onions, mm. and uh, he calls himself Bill Onions. Does he? For some weird reason. Where does that come from? I've never well, met anybody I, called Bill Onions. Oh, I have. I've, I've met people called uh, uh, Onions. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Was that in France? No, it's in England. Well, why would they pronounce it differently? Well, they try. It's like bouquet and bucket, isn't mm. it? If your name's Bucket, Buckethead, you're a bucket, and and they call themselves bouquet for some unknown reason. So they go from being a bucket, which is basically you know a, a sort of piece of plastic with a handle on it, to a um, to a, a, an arrangement of lovely mm. roses Wasn't because they change t- the name from bucket, which is you know a random piece of sort of filthy stuff <laughs> that you get in the garden, to uh, a bunch of roses, bouquet. Bizarre, absolutely mm. bizarre. That was mm. a TV show as well, but we're going to do a TV show yeah. coming up. But before we do that, yeah. Ben Fletcher's here because he's going to tell us what the uh, what the transfer stories are, which hopefully mm. don't involve anyone with unfortunate names. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bucket and Bollock. Mm. It's, it's another enlightening morning. It is. Um, I'm going to I'm going to start with the manager, um, Dick Advocat. Uh, he he was he's back at Sunderland for another don't, year. He's gone. Don't start him off with the singing for heaven's sake. No, yeah. no, I won't. No, I won't. I, won't. <laughs> I promise you, I won't. Yeah. Um, and he's been told apparently he's got twenty five million pounds to spend. Um, it's amazing. Um, which is... I thought it was 50. It well, depends, it, it which, depends, paper depends read, which paper you read. I mean, mm, let's, mm. let's go somewhere in the middle. Let's say 35 million, but yeah. anything between 25 and 50 million. Mm. Um, that for, for a club that don't really generally spend huge sums of money, mm. that's quite big. It um, is. And you know, what you'd expect, really, for a manager of Dick Advocat's stature. Um, so expect to see Sunderland spend some money. It's not said uh, particularly who they're going to go for just yet, mm. but I would, I would expect Sunderland to be busy. I'm in mean, the transfer market, of course, uh, the 1st of July is the big day when players can come and go again. Um, well, I guess it's part of the whole kind of, you know, um, uh, reason for them to go after him and try and persuade him to come back after he said that he wasn't going to. They mm. must have, he must have said, mm. well, I'm only going to do it if you make it kind of possible for me to improve the team in some mm. way. Exactly. And they, they, he's obviously called their bluff and said, well, I'm not staying. And they've said, well, OK, we'll give you the money then. So mm. good, great news for Sunderland. And they, they really could be a powerhouse in the North East. I mean, depending on what happens with... Newcastle and the Mike Ashley Rangers 
strange situation. Right. Uh, Middlesbrough obviously missed out on coming back to the Premier League. You know, why not? Sunderland have got the fan base. They've got a bit of money now. Uh, let's see what's going to happen. Um, we said last night about Raheem Sterling. Um, City, uh, according to the back page of The Sun, Manchester City have apparently now told Liverpool face-to-face that they want him. And Liverpool have said, OK, it's going to cost you £50 million. Mm. And City have said, OK, we'll pay that. So Raheem really? Sterling, 50 million you quid see, apparently. That doesn't do football any good at no, all. It if, if, it's if, not worth it. If, no, but if owners of clubs who have limitless amounts of money in bottomless pockets just cave in to demands of other clubs, just get a player um, comfortably without having to do uh, hassle and negotiate, mm. all they're doing is, is increasing the wage spiral and the value of player spiral. Again, that's why, that's why Andy Carroll suddenly became worth 35 million know, quid when he was worth one third of that. Utterly daft. Was that the same season that uh, Deco was worth 8 million or something? Yeah, I think so. You know, yeah. A legendary Portuguese But I mean, players aren't going to get any cheaper. I mean, in two years' time, you know, the Premier League clubs are going to have even more money, aren't they? So they're going to spend even more money on the players. Yeah, I, 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 I feel you're right. I feel you're right. But mm. but what I'm saying is you get a missed valuation when the club panics. Right, and, yeah. and the only reason Liverpool could do it is they got all that money. For, who did they sell? Was it Suarez? Yeah. yeah. Is that the Suarez money? Yeah, Very it was Suarez, Suarez yeah. money, yeah. yeah. I mean, when you look at uh, uh, The Guardian, though, they're saying that Raheem Sterling is going to go to Manchester United. So, I mean, it's still kind of uh, I, up in the air. I, I think it, he'll go to United. It's, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, if I, you I, had the choice, and li- literally, and, and the difference was like between 175,000 and 200,000, yeah, I'd go to United just for the prestige of, of saying I'm, I play for Manchester United. I think it's less likely to sit on the bench at United. At yeah. least, I think I'd probably rather play for LVG than yeah. uh, Manuel Pellegrini, and yeah. who knows what's going to happen yeah. to but him. But you're, you're right. Manchester me. City, ever since they became you know, the, the cash-rich club, have huge squads, don't they? Yeah. Mm. So players are limited in their, in their opportunities. And in fact, some players' careers have been destroyed by yeah. moving to Manchester City. Absolutely. It's, uh, we'll, we'll watch that one, but it looks like either way, we were told Raheem Sterling was going nowhere, but according to a few papers this morning, it looks like that is simply not the case. Um, another Manchester United player, Angel Di Maria, this is still the back page of the Sun. He says he's staying put. Um, poor campaign. Uh, he was the record signing, £59.7 million pounds, yeah. uh, for Angel Di Maria. Not a great season. OK, he had uh, injury problems and he maybe played out of position and whatnot. But he said uh, he wants to stay put. He's going to play in the Copa America and then move back to Manchester for um, the next season. So that will be a boost for them. Yeah. Uh, Player staying put. What about the just... guy they've got on loan, the most expensive loan in the world? That's uh, Falcao. 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 Yeah. Falcao. What's, what's, Falcao. To, what's going to happen to him? Well, a lot of people uh, think, think, he's going, he's, lot of people think, think he's going to Chelsea, which would be a bit of a surprise. Well, it's it? a permanent move. Yeah. Not another loan. Mm. Mm. Well, Jean Luc Vialli said, you know, uh, on kickoff last night that it would be a great signing. Jose Mourinho is one of the best managers in the world. He'll get the best out of him. And it's just another special player at Chelsea, mm. isn't it? If mm. the deal does go through, you've mm. got uh, Eden Hazard there, uh, Diego Costa. And uh, Radamel Falcao, it's, it's like, you know, we, we had a dearth of what I call Hollywood footballers in the Premier League in the last couple of years, but they don't now seem to be mm, shoring up at Chelsea. Indeed. Yeah, interesting. Indeed. Mm. And then uh, what about uh, uh, Nani? Apparently Manchester United are going to sell him this summer as well. Yeah, I mean, it's been a strange one, Nani, hasn't it? He's been one of these players that I think people got a bit overexcited with Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, and they thought, oh, another Portuguese player mm. who mm. looks a bit like Cristiano Ronaldo. Mm. He's bound to be good. And it never really worked out for him. Had a couple of glimpses of what he was capable of. But, yeah, it looks like he's going to be heading towards the exit door. And if, mm. if United are going to be keeping hold of Di Maria, if they do get hold of Raheem Sterling, um, it's difficult to see where Nani fits into that side. Mm. I mean, he's, sure. he's barely used as, as a utility player as it is. in the mm. Well, not that Man United were in the Champions League last sure. season, but if, well, as and when they get into it this season, which they have done, yeah. uh, I really can't even see him doing that. No, yeah, indeed. And still no news on Everton by the looks of it, so they're not being linked with anyone. Yeah, yeah, no news on Everton at the moment. It, Lukaku, the, I guess you hope he does stay put. But um, yeah, well, only, only if he wants to play for Everton. I don't want him to stay put if his heart's not in it. Because frankly, that is just a bad attitude in the dressing room. It certainly you is. Go and we we'll get somebody else. It certainly is. We'll be Absolutely. talking some more about transfers, mm. of course, uh, throughout the summer here on Talk Sport. Coming up next, though, it's time for the Porky Quiz. <laughs> I feel so confident about this one. It really, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, being um, uh, trite here, but I am masterful on that subject. Well, I guess we'll find out whether you are indeed masterful on uh, the subject of Coronation Street, subject you chose uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, the questions are in. They've been compiled by uh, mm-hmm. uh, the independent quiz masters oh, as yeah, ever. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, and you had no influence on them whatsoever. Not at all, no. No, and you, you just, just alter them. And they, the more I get right, the more you try I've to I've make only just, more I've only just seen them. I've only just seen them now. What's I've only just been, uh, been passed to me. Now, as ever... You're being uh, untruthful. If you get a, a, a question right, uh, you will hear this sound. Have you sold that sideboard to Will Robden? 
Ooh, and if that. you get one wrong, yeah. you'll hear this. Bell top, you, you Welsh rabbit! Oh, mm, dear. Right, so, mm. are you ready to go with question number one? Yeah, let's go, please. Question number one. When was the first episode of Coronation Street broadcast? It was in 1963. Incorrect. Bell no, it's top, not. You, you Welsh rabbit! No, it's not. December the 9th, 1960. What? December the 9th, 1960 is the answer. Ah, no, I'm sorry. No, you, you asked the wrong question. What do you mean? The first episode of Coronation Street in a studio was in 1963. From 1960, they actually did them live. OK. Did them well, live the from 1960. Broad, well, the first episode nope. was 1960. Yeah, but that was live. That was live. Well, it was still the first episode. No, no, no. Coronation Street, as a recorded programme, started in 1963. Well, I didn't ask you when they started recording. Well, I know too much detail about it, and I was on extra detail. I deserve a, a replay on that question. Zero out of one. Question number I two. I deserve a replay. What was the highest ever audience for an episode? Of Coronation Street? Yeah. Uh, 21.2 million. Uh, do you know when it was? It was to do with... How many questions are there here? Uh, well, there's, the, the question is, what was the highest ever audience yeah, for an episode? Yeah, well, I've just given you the answer. Well, that's not right. What do you mean it's not right? It's 27 million. Not 27 million. It is 27 million. Not Christmas 27 million. Day, 1987, the departure of Hilda Ogden. Hilda Ogden. Hmm. Mm. top, you, you Welsh rabbit! But that's not a normal episode. That was a special episode. It was the for a normal highest, episode. It was twenty one point two million. It was the highest ever audience for an episode. Well, I'm, I'm, that was Christmas special though, and it's on Christmas Day. It doesn't count. Yeah, it does count. Question it's like, number it's like three. The Ken Dodd show. Question number three. You heard the iconic theme tune at the start of the quiz. Do you yes. know who wrote it? Um, some bloke with a trumpet. Some bloke with a trumpet. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you'll have to be a bit more specific. Was it a trumpet? Herb Alpert? No, it wasn't Herb Alpert. No. Um, uh, who wrote it? Yes. Who wrote it? Yeah, it was Johnny somebody. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny... You're looking to me for clues? I can't give you any clues. It was, it was Johnny... Um, let me think, let me think, let me think. It wasn't... Uh, I reckon it was... Uh, um, who's that guy who's got that jazz club in Soho? Johnny Dankworth. Johnny Dankworth. Ronnie Johnny, Scott. J- Ronnie Scott, Ronnie Scott, Johnny... I think Johnny Dankworth. Incorrect. Bell yeah. top, you, you Welsh rabbit! Well, you gave me a clue there, and it was a wrong clue. Well, I didn't give you any clues. So you led me into penury. No, no, I'm not allowed to give you any clues. It was Eric Spear. Eric Spear? Who's he? Uh, He wrote the uh, Coronation Street theme tune. Really? Question number four. Should have written the theme tune to Zulu with a name like that. The street was named Mm. after the coronation of which king? Um, What? The street was named after the coronation of which king? Which king? Which king? Coronation Street, which king? Um, I would say King, King, uh, George. George the what? Um, hang on a second, I'm getting distracted here. Um, let me think. It's King, it's either King Edward or King George. And, uh, I'm trying to think of... Well, you have to give me a name and a number. Uh, okay, it was, um... It was King Edward the Sixth. King Edward the Seventh. Seventh. Incorrect. So Seventh. You, you Welsh rabbit. Unfortunate. That's a zero out of four. Was How it? many episodes have been well, made? Hang on. Who, who, which king was it then? It was Edward the Seventh. I said that. No, you said the sixth. Rubbish. I said King Edward. You said King Edward the Sixth. No, I said King Edward. It doesn't matter whether it was the fifth, sixth, seventh. No, or I said or I needed end. a name and a number. No, you didn't. You said which king. You did not say a number. I you said, said I you need did a name not. And a number. I protest. You... Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, listen, we'll we, can play, we can play back the question. You only said which king. I said I need a name and a number. No, you did not. And you said Edward no, the Six. You did not. I'm asking for the uh, invigilator here to uh, to tell me you did not ask for a number. Well, I did actually. You didn't. Yeah, I did. That's why you gave me one. Anyway, Sheet. question number five, uh, and I'll give you this to the nearest hundred. Okay. Mm. How many episodes have been made of Coronation Street? Coronation Street. How many episodes? And you've got to the nearest hundred, which I think is pretty generous. Hang on, I'm going to work this out now. Wait a minute, a second. Hang on a sec. Uh, right, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you want us right. to play some music? No, 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 no. Hang on, hang on. Um, no, no, that's distracting me. I need to concentrate. You? Well, yeah, you can't yeah. just have like, yeah, nothing yeah, going yeah, yeah. on while you Hang on, hang on, hang on. While you do long division. Hang on, no, 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 no. Five minutes. Wait a minute, I'm working this out. Uh, uh, I reckon it's 250 times 55, which is five noughts and all. Five fives are 25. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Five twos are like 10. Human calculator. And two's 12. Yeah, yeah. Five noughts and all. Five fives are 25. Five twos are 10. Uh, right. Uh, I reckon the answer is. 
Um, hang on. It's... I'll have to hurry you. Yeah, OK. I think it's 32,500. Incorrect. What do you mean? Bounce <laughs> off you, you bounce rabbit! It's nowhere near. It's 8,655. Mm. So you've got zero out of five. Uh, five zeros are indeed null. These are stupid questions, um, though. Now, question number six. Mm. When were Stan and Hilda Ogden introduced as characters? Stan and Hilda Ogden yeah. introduced as characters? Yeah. What year? Uh, that would be 1967. Incorrect. Bounce off you, you Welsh rabbit! 1964. 1964. You're not very good at this, are you? Question I'm number very seven. Good. I'm very good, but this is so far back now. You haven't asked me a single question about Coronation Street after the year 1967. All right, well, here not goes, a single uh, one. Here goes a question for you. How did Maxine Peacock die? Maxine Peacock? Yeah. Maxine Peacock was hit over the head. Uh, OK. And murdered. And murdered. I'll give you a point for Thank that. You. Have you saw that hey. sideboard to where we're hey. She was murdered by Richard Hillman. Yeah. With uh, an iron bar. Yeah, uh, Tricky Dicky, as he was known. Uh, and she yeah. was played by Tracy Shaw, right? Yes, that's right. Question yeah. number eight. What was Curly Watts' hobby? Curly Watts' hobby? Well, Curly Watts was a bin man who became a supermarket manager, right? And, his ho- and he married Raquel... And he had um, uh, the Milky Bar Kid glasses. Uh-huh. And what? What was his hobby? His hobby? Yeah. His hobby? Yeah. His hobby was... Curly, what's his hobby? I don't think he had a hobby, actually, but I'm trying to think. Hang on, hang on. His hobby would have been... Ah. Ah. He might have had pigeons with Jack. Uh, he did not have pigeons with Jack. That's incorrect. I was thinking loud. I was thinking loud. That's not my answer. Oh, you'd like to have that's, another guess? Yeah, with yeah. You? That's not my answer. Well, no. Since you've only got one out of ten, no, I'll give you no, a guess. Hang on. My answer would be. Uh, let me see. I think his hobby was fishing. You're just making it up. His no, 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 no. His hobby was astronomy. He installed astronomy. a telescope in his loft. Sounds like rubbish. That's question me. number nine. Which yeah. brewer supplies the Rovers' return? Sure, you know this one. Uh, yes, uh, the brewers in the Rovers' Return are... And Annie Walker used to go and see... I've got to go to the brewery. Oh, oh, what are they called? Um, it's something like... It's not Abbott Ale. That's a real one over in Cambridgeshire. It was... And it's not Theakstons, although it sounds a bit like Theakstons. It is Newton and Ridley. Correct. Hey. Have you saw that sideboard woo, to where we're woo, 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 surely, woo. surely you get that one right. Right, final woo, question. Woo, question number woo, ten. Woo. What was the last thing Leanne Battersby said to Cal before he was killed? Ah, oh, that was... Yes, I would marry you. Correct. Hey. Have you saw that sideboard oh, to where we're oh, 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 oh. Well done, you made so, a good recovery so, there. So when you ask sensible questions, I get the answers, you yeah. see. Well, you ask me stupid sensi- questions. They were from, all sensible questions. You have a grand total... episodes before I was born. You have a grand total... Uh, well, I don't think it started before you were born, did mm. it? Uh, three out of ten. Well, which is par know. for the course for you for an expert well. subject. You said you're going to get eight. Yeah, I thought I'd get eight. But you asked me all the wrong questions again. I do think, you know, I wish it was an individual, uh, independent invigilator who set the questions. It is. It's not. It is. That's why they're so you fair. You have a huge influence on Very, it. very fair-minded. Mm. Uh, anyway, we'll have to fi- find out what you can do next week as a, as a, a porky quiz. Mm. But uh, three, I think three out of ten is pretty much average for you, so yeah. it's not bad I, at I, all. I don't like being average. No, that was the porky quiz. Uh, we've got loads more coming out. We'll talk about beards, I think, coming up next. OK. <laughs> Talk sport. And it's in! A diving header at the end of a 50 yard run. From the root to the tip. Talk sport. This is Talk Sport Extra Time with the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on, usually around about 9 o'clock this morning. You have to follow us at the two mics and you should be able to find it there. Uh, we've got lots more to do in the, uh, uh, the short amount of time we've got left, Mr Parry. Uh, obviously, it's a very busy weekend for mm. all sorts of reasons, for mm. all sorts of people as well. Mm. Now, some, something that I spotted in the papers that I was going to ask you about... Oh, yes. Uh, ...is that uh, uh, beards are apparently now becoming more popular than ever, and I blame Gary Lineker for this because he's had this little kind of goatee beard yeah. thing going on for that, almost the whole season. Mm. Which actually looks OK on him, yes. but it doesn't look OK on an awful lot of people. Um, well, does it look OK on him? I, I think mean, he looks quite sharp with it. You yeah. know, we're all in the same business. I'm not in the, uh, I'm not in the, the business of uh, going around criticising fellow broadcasters and all that kind of stuff, but I actually think he looks, you know, OK without a beard, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I think Paul Gascoigne looks OK without a beard. I mm. think Paul Gascoigne looks a little bit silly. Well, he did have a kind of odd beard, didn't he, Paul he uh, An odd beard. But the reason it's coming back, I don't think it's anything to do with that. I think it's to do with the fact that the hirsuteness... Mm. Hirsuteness. Hirsuteness. Yeah, that, uh, that men adopt 
uh, uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly improves their masculinity Do you think so? factor to women. I think it's just a trendy thing, though. No, I, I mean, your beard has been pretty much exactly the same ever since I've known you. You've never yes. actually changed the shape of it or no. changed the way that exactly. it kind of uh, uh, sits there on your face. I mean, just, you don't really do that of, much to it. Just sort of suits my face. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I tell you what, it'd be weird now if I got rid of it. People would look at me in a, in a different sort of a way, you know what I mean? Well, they would. And, but, and, but, the point, but the point about yeah. the new beards, as it yes. were, which are not that new, actually, but mm. the, because mm. there's now kind of a secondary type of beard. The, the Gary Lineker kind of, you know, yeah. um, goatee beard is the new beard. But you still see a lot of these kind of, uh, you know, trendy young men walking around with sure. these great big bushy beards. Sure, right? sure. Um, I mean, just diverting from beards for a minute to Gary Lineker. Yeah. He must be Britain's most successful sports presenter now yes. by a mile. He's just signed a new and, contract, did Well, he? I sent out a tweet today when I saw that. He signed a new contract for the BBC oh. for five years. Right. And I asked the question, I mean this quite seriously, will the BBC still be there in five years? Well, I'm sure the BBC will be there in five years in some way, shape or form. Are you sure? Whether, whether, I'm not sure that what they will have, though, is yeah. any kind of uh, serious football, because I, I, they I might mean, be told uh, that they can't bid for it anymore. Well, that's right. Uh, I mean, well, they were already coming under pressure, weren't they, to not yeah. bid for, a ne- for the next World Cup, just in case, for some reason, mm. um, you know, there was some jiggery-pokery attached to putting you know, taxpayers' money into it. Or their charts was changed or something like that. You're, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that whilst I'm... Uh, I'm not knocking, you know, this is just the, is the BBC. Mm. We've now got a culture secretary, John Whittingdale, yeah. my friend, who is very much of the mood to examine the role of the BBC, the funding mm. of the BBC, and, you know, the, its, its presence in our lives these days with pay-per-view television. Yeah, but I don't think they're going to even, mm. uh, at, at whatever rate they go at, they're not yes. going to be able to dismantle something as big as that in well, five I, years. I don't think they should dismantle I think there's a lot of very good aspects of the BBC, but what I'm saying is they've got to become more accountable for the money we pay, and in particular... In particular, in particular, the number of people there who... Um, this shouldn't be about the BBC, really, should it? The number of people there who uh, actually, who actually, right, uh, earn vast amounts of money. Mm. Vast amounts of money for doing nothing. There's guys there who earn £300,000 a year because they've been appointed director of something within the BBC and nobody knows what they do. Right. And I mean nobody. And also, you get the feeling of uh, cronyism. You know, that, uh, that people appoint their mates there from other areas of the media, like but the Times newspaper it's not about and the Guardian. The BBC, though, is it? No, it's not. It's about razors. Now, yeah. what I was going to say was sales of razors and blades, because yeah. this is part of uh, the research I put into this when okay. you were talking about it earlier. Um, sales of razors and blades have fallen sharply, down 3.6% since last year, OK? Mm. Um, which means that men aren't shaving as often, no, which means not. it's the growth of beards, OK? And Procter and Gamble, which owned the shaving giant Gillette, you know. What's, uh, what's the song about Gillette? I don't know. Oh, I know. I've never heard I, of Gillette's song. I, I know, I know. I worked with a, a girl once called... Gillette. No, Jill. Uh-huh. She's called Jill. I mean, her name was Gillian, but it's shortened to Jill, right? Jill and, and she was Bolick. No, she was just Jill, mm. and uh, she was a beautiful girl who worked in a newsroom, you know. Right. Was she a secretary? No, she wasn't, no. She was a, she was a young, young trainee reporter on oh, the yeah. newspaper I worked on. And whenever she walked past, you know, a certain desk, you know, young men would sing, Gillette, the best a man can get. Is it that old, that song? Yeah, that's is right. It really? yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. It's been around for years. Mm. Um, anyway, look, uh, just to say, uh, nobody knows where the trend started, says the researcher here. Um, but, but, um, hipsters are being blamed. Now, hipsters, you know, do you know what hipsters well, are? Hipsters, these are the guys who grow these very, very sort of long, bushy beards, and you spot yeah, them really? in places like Shoreditch, you spot them in places like Borough Market. Oh, is that what they are? Uh, yeah, and they're very, very sort of uh, relatively young men right. well, with look, these ridiculously long beards. Apparently, the guy who leads the hipster community in this country is a Scottish model called Christopher John Millington. Oh, really? Have you ever heard of him? Never heard of him, Neither no. have I. Social scientists say it's a reflection of masculinity. I told you. Um, oh, no, sorry. It's a, it's a reflection of masculinity being under threat ah. and men fighting back. Oh, is that right? So men being over-dominated by women, uh, what men do in response mm. is grow a bushy beard to uh, endorse their masculinity. Yeah, okay? I think it's strange because, I mean, there are now lots of mm. different types of beards being worn. And, in fact, I think we, you and I spoke about this last year where there was yeah. hipsters from New York who mostly live in Brooklyn now oh, yeah. who are going down to Florida to actually have beards implanted into their face because they wanted to grow it in a particular way. Not everybody right. can grow a beard the way that they actually want to grow one. Right, okay. I mean, if you wanted to grow, like, a really long, bushy yeah, beard, yeah. Would, would that happen? What, you mean, you mean Chuck Blazer style? Uh, yeah. You'd look utterly ridiculous, wouldn't you? Well, you would, yeah. Yeah, I, he looks ridiculous. Anyway, listen, there's a, uh, there's a contradiction here, mm. because although um, sales of razors and blades and instants and all that kind of stuff are going down, yeah. what is going up 
is the sale of skincare products for men. Yes. Because it says even if they've got beards, mm. the bits that don't have hair on their face become more important to them because of the contrast with the bearded part of the yeah. face. Do you know what I mean? So they're mo- wearing so more moisturiser. More, more moisturiser on their do noses. Any, do you use any products like that? Any male no. grooming products? No, I don't. I couldn't care less if my face falls to pieces mm. over the next ten years. Really? It doesn't bother me. Well, I, suppose... I don't care what other people think about how I look. But don't you worry about when you go out in the sun and it gets no. dry and all that kind no, of thing? No, 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 because I don't go out in the sun. Mm. I don't go out in the sun. If I go out in the sun, I wear a hat, uh, but I don't go out in the sun much except to get some vitamin D mm. because I don't want to get rickets. No, of course. So, um, so that's, I don't think you get rickets, would no. you? Oh, you do if At you don't get age, vitamin D. You? Well, you might. And uh, But I don't put anything on my face at all. I see no need. Mm. I want to have a lived-in face, not a face that has been artificially preserved. Yes. Well, you though... have got a lived-in face, that's true. So you're not doing anything to the beard then at all? Do you not kind of clip it or, or cut it in, in any way? Do you keep it? Because it keeps... It doesn't seem to yeah, grow. I've, yeah, I've got a... I've it got doesn't got a... seem to grow at all. I've got a... Um, I've got a little device which Maybe. is my own grooming uh, you know it, it you know it buzzes you know bzzz, what an electric bzzz, razor you mean bzzz. no it's not a razor it's a grooming an electric trimmer yeah trimmer a trimmer a you know bzzz. so how often do you use that bzzz. then bzzz. oh once a week at least really bzzz. so what would happen if you didn't bzzz. use it why are you making that ridiculous uh, uh, noise because that's the noise of the trimmer mm. and also i've got a collection of different uh, depth of um so you take this all uh, quite seriously oh, oh yeah so uh, for uh, someone uh, who says that yeah. you don't actually care what mm. your face looks like no Sounds like you take a lot of time. To, oh no, to but I don't want beard to look ridiculous. A bit, a, a, an uncouth beard which is too long looks ridiculous. So you have well, to keep it neatly looks trimmed. Ridiculous anyway, though, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, it does no, no I'm not taking that as an insult because I know you don't mean it. Um, now, analysts say that the the um, the beard uh, revolution is mm. also innovating a whole range of new products, such as uh, you know trimmers, clippers, eye creams, revitalizers, and one that's not worth talking about. Nose clippers. Nose clippers, yeah. yeah. Who'd want a nose clipper? Well, you need to clip the hairs in your nose, don't you? Oh, when you get to a certain age, then the hairs in your nose well, start growing. You well, do it's, not do that. it's not something that we men talk about, but, no, yeah, okay. I suppose it is part of the grooming process. You're mm. absolutely right, yeah. Um, and also, apparently, some people use these nose clippers on their ears. Yes. To um, Well, that's the thing. Know, I mean, yeah. when you get mm. older, as yeah. you are, you must have no, noticed not. that hairs I, grow no, out no. of places that you don't want them to grow. Well, I haven't. Don't worry about that, pal. I know exactly what's going on. Do you? Uh, right, now then, uh, we have to talk about the weekend. Yes, we do. Because uh, we have an exciting weekend ahead, starting with a, uh, a little get-together this afternoon with a few colleagues. Is that's that right? True. Yeah, I think mm. so. Well, not yeah. so much this afternoon. It's later on this evening. Later on this evening, that's right, yeah. Because mm. we've had a bit of a revolution, haven't we, at TalkSport? Uh, true. Uh, over the last 24 hours. A few of our colleagues have moved into... Um, uh, well, it's good... all about the kind of expansion of things. Yeah, right? exactly. Moved into good positions. are going to have great careers and do brilliant jobs. And uh, we're going to build TalkSport into the greatest broadcasting organisation in the world. Mm. And, the, and, and the kind of get-together was to celebrate ten years since yes. uh, UTV bought TalkSport, of course. Absolutely, that's right, yeah. And, uh, and you know, forwards... A and tumultuous ten years, that's a, been. A tumultuous ten years, onwards and upwards and all that kind of stuff, and it's going to be great. Is there going to be another book coming out, do you think? Because there was a book that came out of ten years of TalkSport, well, which was not so much ten years of UTV hmm, at TalkSport. Then maybe yeah. you should do another book. Well, the point is, the book that came out um, about TalkSport, yeah. right... Um, which I sort of contributed a little bit to. Did you? I suddenly discovered mm. when it was published yeah. had huge chunks of um, there's an awful lot of bubbly in Brazil. Oh really? Um, uh, in what, it borrowed sort of um, rather yeah sort of famously. Well, without permission. Well, I'm not accusing anybody of plagiarism, mm. but I mean I have to say there was uh, about plagiarism. Uh, plagiarism. I'm not accusing anybody of that, but there were there were a lot of bits of you know uh, an awful lot of bubbly in Brazil. What very mean, similar, not... very similar to the official history of Talks More. Let what do you mean you the that. actual stories themselves, or were they just yeah. huge chunks of of, yeah, yeah. of of sort of you know block type? Well, I'm not going to. I've just separated. told you I'm not accusing anybody of plagiarism, mm. but you know you have to wonder where they got the idea for some of those chapters. Well, from. I would thought you'd quite like that because it meant right? at least some of the stories mm. that were in uh, mm. an awful lot of bubbly. Mm. That were actually true. Uh, well, of course they're true. I mean, I lived through them. So, I mean, what are you suggesting? You're suggesting that a I was bladdered for ten years and therefore couldn't remember what no, I'm happened. I'm not suggesting that make at it all. up. I'm not suggesting that Or are that you at suggesting all. that I, you know, I, I um, uh, purposely went around inventing a scenario that never happened? I don't think so. All I'm saying is, that if the stories are being told in another book, mm. then it must mean that you know there are other people that know about the stories and you just lift them from your book. So you would automatically assume that they were lifted, where in fact they might not have been. They might have just been told by somebody else about some uh, about the same event, and so everybody has the same memory. Well, yes, but if the story involved Mr. Brazil and myself, and yes. we were the only two people there at the time, and nobody ever came and asked me about it. Well, maybe it. they asked Mr Brazil about it. No, they didn't. Mm. I checked it, I checked it. But no. anyway, I'm not, I'm not arguing. You know, it's a great organisation. It should be documented and chronicled and... Uh, 
you know, um, you know, who knows who might write. Well, of course, in days gone by, you'd have been Mm. hopping off down to the Epsom Racecourse, wouldn't you, over the weekend? No. No, I wouldn't. I mean, I I could go. It's uh, I, it's walking distance to me, Epsom Racecourse. That's yeah. no problem at all. But there are too many other busy things happening this weekend. Mm. For instance, you and I are on stage on yeah, Sunday night. Yeah, that's true, on Sunday. We're looking forward to that. But Alan Brazil and Mickey Quinn are coming live from there the, on the sports Oh, it'll be brilliant. It'll be brilliant. I remember we went there one year, right, and went up onto the roof of the Queen Elizabeth stand. Yeah. And went up there to get an overall view of the race course and to see Jim, our um, tech op, mm. God rest his soul. What was he doing on the roof? He was fixing an aerial. Oh, OK. He was fixing an aerial so that we got a, you know, a much greater uh, range. And well, I was shocked when I got up there to find a policeman lying on his stomach um, with a sniper rifle on a tripod. Really? Uh, yeah, with a sight in it. Mm. And, and uh, you know, How did you manage to get up on the roof if there was a police sniper up there? Well, because Wasn't there supposed to be some kind of security to stop you doing that? Uh, no, not at all, because we had broadcasting passes and we needed access to the roof to right. uh, put the aerial up and all that kind of stuff, you know. Mm. But uh, And he took it so nonchalantly, I, you know, I sort of jumped because I've never seen such a powerful ri- rifle like that, you know. And I said, oh, hi. He said, hi, guys, are you all right? I said, yeah. He said, OK, fine. And it was like he, the gun didn't exist, you know mm. what I mean? It was like part of his working apparel and, uh, and he didn't say it was anything uh, really special. Mm. But it's brilliant doing the derby because... The the whole atmosphere of the place is so ebullient. Mm. You've got to remember... In the Have you been there since they moved it from a Wednesday, though? Oh, yes, many times. Have you? Oh, yeah, well, it, it was on a Wednesday. last time I went, it was on a Wednesday. Yeah, well, that was when we were at the Daily Express. We had always take Wednesday afternoon off and go and get flatterated down at Epsom. No, I went and, and then, covered it, actually. And uh, Did you? Yeah. Oh, I did, and I went there socially. But unfortunately, mm. that night I got arrested by the uh, diplomatic squad in an Indian restaurant yes. for having a punch-up with Charlie Sale. Yes, which is never yeah. a good way yeah. to end the it's day, a, really, It's not a good it? way to end the day, really, but mm. there you go. You know, the chronicles of time's gone by. Mm. Yeah, and how did you get out of that one? Uh, I sort of pleaded uh, in kind of insanity, really. <laughs> you, 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 know, you know, sort of like, you know, bladderation insanity, yeah. if you see what I mean. They were very forgiving, the cops. All well, they said was that I disturbed them at the end of a long, hard day when they were having a quiet meal mm. in an Indian restaurant, but it wasn't my fault because Charlie Sale leaned across the table and punched me in the face. So right. when that happens, you have to retaliate. Yes, I suppose so. You and, must have uh, provoked him And he got way, a chicken corner in his gob, so yeah. uh, that was all right. It's always with the physical violence, isn't it, with yeah, you? Well, no, no, I try not to, but, you know, get, uh, you get provoked. All right, well, I will see you later on in the day. Anyway, mm-hmm. thank you very much indeed. There will mm-hmm. be a podcast coming out, of course, uh, for follow us at The Two Mics, and you'll find out when that's coming out in around about uh, five hours' time or so, uh, something like that. And, of course, uh, uh, if you go to twomics.co.uk, two mm-hmm. uh, you'll find all the information you may need if you want to come to the show on Sunday night. Still a few tickets We'd left. love to see you there. And, it's in the uh, West End. It's in James Theatre. Yeah, come it's in along. Victoria, actually, technically, but uh, we yes. thought it was West End. This is Talk Sport. We are the Two Mics. Look at the light! Don't forget to follow the Two Mics at the Two Mics on Twitter and on YouTube. Just look for Two Mics TV. The apes invent a cooker with stones. All right. Because if you if you put a load of stones together in the hot midday sun mm. in Rwanda, yeah. the inside of the stones gets very hot, and apes have realised this. So, so they when they made an oven. They made an oven. They make they make ovens. Okay. The apes make ovens, and they put the meat in the ovens, and the meat cooks. That, so it's honestly. like a stone baked kind of oven. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's very much like that. Very much like that. Also, it's not just meat that uh, apes now cook. They cook their potatoes, sweet potatoes. They stick them in their ovens as well. Are they vegetarians? These apes then? No, of course they're not. How can an, uh, uh, an ape be a vegetarian if it's sticking meat in the oven? Her name is Kate Bollock. If you love the Two Mics podcast, you'll love the live show. Weekday overnights from 1am on DAB Digital Radio and 1089 and 1053 AM and via the TalkSport app. TalkSport, your Premier League station with exclusive commentaries every weekend. What an absolute corker. TalkSport.